part one of the american far west seven mid-nineteenth century views from abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the american far west seven mid-nineteenth century views from abroad by anonymous part one far western newspapers there is not a town anywhere in the west of sufficient importance to be reckoned a right smart chance of a city without a local weekly bi-weekly or even daily newspaper as it is impossible for the whole community to be of one mind in matters political we generally find one devoted to the interests of the democratic party and a second to the well-cherished opinions of the republicans these two parties dividing social affairs and public and private life in the far west now what do i mean by the far west a term often used but with a most indefinite application about new york the term is applied to the region of which chicago is the centre if you go to chicago you will find that the railway companies are advertising the far west as omaha at omaha on the missouri utah seems to be that born while again at the city of the saints it is oregon or california somewhere about the pacific at all events whether the people of the pacific coast have any place where they locate the far west it is hard to say probably china and japan would be about the nearest whereabout of that geographically relative locality the scene of the following sketches will lie broadly speaking in the region on either side of the rocky mountains somewhere in the wilds of those new states and territories which are now and again springing up out of the wilderness which are peopled by an ever-moving and adventurous people not by any means barbarous yet far from refined in fact of that peculiar type known well enough in those parts of the world as the western man it is with the ruder type of newspaper produced in such out-of-the-way places as lie within the shadow of the rocky mountains the sierra nevadas of california or the cascade mountains of oregon or idaho with their characteristics and with their humour that i propose to deal the flourishing state of ephemeral literature on the shores of the pacific associated as it will ever be in our minds with buoy knives and nuggets cannot be better expressed than by stating that in the city of san francisco alone numbering one hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants and nineteen years ago consisting of only a few cotton tents on some sand hills there are published no fewer than forty-five periodicals comprising ten dailies eight monthlies one semi-weekly one tri-weekly and two annuals of these three are published in the german language three in the spanish and two in french the gold of california has attracted men clever in every department of brain and handicraft and accordingly we find these periodicals edited with good ability and even refinement it is only when we get up in the interior that we find the western editor in all his crudity suppose that it should ever fall to the lot of a wise man of the east to ride some summer day into one of these quiet little western towns situated on a prairie or by some river with a not euphonious name where it is difficult to say when the town commences and the country ends or which is which and where the inhabitants in their dolce far niente longer seem to wish like the lotus-eaters as they tilt their rocking-chairs on the shady side of the street in front of the grocery store that it was always afternoon before he has well taken off his jingling mexican spurs or imbibed a preliminary drink with the landlord of the hotel he will be accosted by a shabby genteel individual whom by the shrewdly telling questions he puts the traveller will have no difficulty in recognising as the local editor if he has not done so already himself colonel homer s smith mine host will soon take upon himself a western landlord's privilege of introducing you to a doctor a captain judge or mr ossian e dodge editor of the swampville flag of liberty and one of our most distinguished citizens sir 
if he be not of the same way of thinking in political matters it is immaterial for this civility will only be delayed a few minutes until the opposition editor from across the way makes his appearance in his shirt-sleeves to take his meridian cocktail and to squeeze out of the new arrival all the public news he may possess for the public good in a professional way or true to his country matters of private history for his own private satisfaction as you get better acquainted with your friend you will find that he is far from being such a truculent fellow as his leaders and personal items might lead you to suppose he will hospitably ask you to come up to my office captain write your letters there sir and when you look into his office which is generally press-room composing-room and study with little furniture beyond a saliva-rusted stove a spittoon and a huge rocking-chair of cheap construction you will find that it seems to be a general loafing-place for the more idle of the citizens of the political opinions which the flag professes there they are all smoking chewing tobacco eating apples or ruminating with chair tilted back or sitting on the step in front of the office door only occasionally moving over to the neighboring bar-room to put in a blast or to hist in a drop of pison the editor will now and then if not better employed rush out to ask a passing acquaintance if he has not such a thing as an item about him or will bolt round the corner of the street to pump a rusty gold miner who has just now wearily trudged into town for the week's supply of pork and beans shortly afterwards you will see the two adjourning to take a drink or if news from the diggings at mad mule canyon or shirt tail bar footnote well-known mining localities in california and footnote is of a particular spicy character the miner will adjourn to the office there his news will be set up in due course and he will be invited to take a char doubtless not only in hospitality but also with eye to the policy of keeping him out of the way of the opposition already on the qui vive for in these dull die-away mining or rural villages in some mountain valley of the far west a man with news is an important personage and comports himself most properly as one from cities the telegraph and the mail may bring matters of general interest to all alike but the local items of a difficulty down at greaser's camp or a gold strike in black jack's claim at yuba dam are matters which must be picked up by that most industrious individual the local editor or as he is called in other places reporter if the paper is going to press and there is a dearth of items under the column local there is nothing for it but to extemporize some or resort to that unfailing remedy of a newsless editor write letters on local grievances to himself and answer them in the next issue in many years wanderings about the less settled portions of the slopes of the rocky mountains i have had much intercourse pleasant on the whole with the western editor scattered through my notebooks are various memoranda illustrative of these rough spurtings of literary effort in a roughly organized state of society the editor works to please the public and from the paper can generally be drawn a tolerably fair picture of the community for which it is produced tinctured of course with more or less of the individual peculiarities of the presiding spirit i must in honesty explain that no one need expect in a few glances over a single file of western newspapers to find so many strongly marked characteristics as occur within narrow limits in a gathering like mine for that contains picked specimens culled at wide intervals on the other hand i can assert that as they were not gathered with any special object in view they are fairly representative and in no case is there the slightest exaggeration the editor himself has generally been brought up as a printer and not unfrequently in case of accident will set up and work off his own leader not unfrequently he puts in his time at case and if he be of a speculative turn of mind drives the stage-coach or runs the hotel but oftener he is a local attorney filling up his spare time with politics and possibly sits in the territorial legislature 
there is not i believe a politician of any eminence in this wise who at one time or other has not been a printer or a lawyer the former generally graduating into the latter as the world deals more kindly with him or ambition pricks him on he very seldom sticks to the editorial desk but gravitates with western versatility into some other more lucrative line of business if he be sufficiently talkative he takes to politics and runs for the local legislature or the district judgeship or if muscularly inclined you will find him working in a mining claim or engaged in fulfilling a contract to blaze a trail the first thing which attracts attention in the little dirty-looking ill-printed sheet is its astounding personality that personality being generally not so much directed against the other party or even against the rival paper as representing the other party as against the editor of it in his private capacity every western editor's name is prominently printed at the head of his paper and instead of talking as he of the eatonwill gazette might of our contemptible contemporary the journal the western paper talks of that low-lived hound cephas e slocum who edits the miserable two-bit thing over the way footnote one bit five pence to seven pence and two bits one shilling being about the ordinary price of a single newspaper to the west of the rocky mountains the former is the lowest coin in general circulation however if taken by the week the usual subscription for a daily paper is only one shilling delivered End footnote. the editor of a san jose paper quarrels with another editor listen to his description of his friend's character Quote, he is a professional loafer and may generally be seen round drinking saloons not only at election times but for years after he makes a game of politics and plays as he would a game of short cards or cutthroat monte to win he wears his hair short a style known as the fighting cut that he may be always ready for a scrimmage and that his adversary may take no undue advantage the preponderance of his brains is located between his ears his countenance is concave and one or both his eyes are usually in mourning from the effects of his last fight he is powerful in primaries where he votes early and often for his favorite candidates succeeds and calls the nomination regular in the matter of piety long prayers and so forth that is entirely out of his line cursing is more especially his fort he can tell the difference between a whisky straight and a gin cocktail with his eyes shut and can snuff a treat two blocks off he spends his money with blank and makes it a point of honor never to pay an honest debt he accepts office for the sake of the stealings and is loyal because it pays best End quote there is no joke here the man is perfectly in earnest as none who knew the pair of worthies would for a moment doubt nothing can more thoroughly express his personality as well as the absolute dearth of local news in a mountain newspaper in nevada than the following from the virginia enterprise we observe that briar local of the news footnote i e local editor or reporter and footnote has on a new coat if we remember right there was a dry goods store burnt out a short time ago and that a number of coats which were put on the street for safe keeping after having been saved from the fire were missing of course we don't intend to cast any reflection or to say that briar nipped any of them oh no another indignantly states that it would take the auger of common sense longer to pierce into a certain editor's brain than it would take for a boiled carrot to bore through the alps after this elegant burst of eloquence we may be prepared to learn that william t dowdell an illinois editor having read brick pomeroy out of the democratic party the latter replies by calling dowdell an idiotic swill-headed chunk whereupon dowdell calls brick a pandemoniac paste-pot cut-throat the editor of the oakland news offers a handsome apology to the editor of his san leandro contemporary for a typographical error in calling him a monkey he meant a donkey 
sometimes these personal pen battles are a little more truculent there is a well-known editor out west of the name of prentice prentice is never known to be put out and accordingly mr smith we shall call him of the cleveland plain dealer made a fatal mistake when he penned the following prentice is a liar and we shall tell him so when we meet him prentice thus replies in his next paper ah will you mr smith about that time there will be a funeral and the smith family will be the principal mourners the following is more in the highly jocose way and coming from a village in the vicinity of san francisco is characteristic enough wanted a calaboose footnote jail End footnote mcquillan of the parajo times is earnestly petitioning the board of supervisors for a calaboose which institution he argues is sadly wanted in the town of watsonville we once spent a week in watsonville and we have no hesitation in saying that mcquillan's head is quite level on the calaboose question a calaboose is sadly needed in that locality so says the dramatic chronicle to which the editor pointly referred to as mcquillan replies in parenthesis at the end of a reprint yes we remember your visit here which suggested to us the necessity of a calaboose my friend the hon w p h is well known in northwest america as the active superintendent of indian affairs in oregon and was at one time editor and is still proprietor of the oregon statesman on one of his tours he captured the wives of the great war chief panin of the shoshones who had for eight years waged continual war against the whites accompanied with most merciless outrages these women were held as hostages and the result was that in the ensuing summer the chief sued for peace and mr h with the officers of the indian department and a party of friends of which the writer of these pages formed one journeyed along the region of the snake river to deliver them up in state our astonishment was great to find our doings subsequently recorded in the opposition paper as follows bill h editor of the statesman went up snake river last week with three squaws the notion evidently being to lead those at a distance who did not know the official character of the journey to suppose that bill h was a person of very immoral life who consorted in trigamic concubinage with aboriginal ladies and that the statesman must be a vile paper to have such an editor some years ago i passed an evening at the dales of the columbia river a locality well known to all readers of early adventure beyond the rocky mountains it is now a little village city of course they call it on the highway to the mines of idaho it was crowded on this particular night with travellers among the motley throng were various newspaper men bound to the mines either to canvass for their papers correspond or generally to look around among others i was introduced to an exceedingly pleasant gentleman called mr samuel bowers editor of a portland paper he was an excellent fellow affable and pleasant and after the manners and customs of the country we had many drinks together i believe we engaged to correspond what was my delight when the dales mountaineer the weekly paper came out next morning to find the following anent my friend of the evening before who was now on his way up the columbia river miners look out among other rogues thieves cutthroats rowdies and blackguards generally whom we noticed in the city last night was sam bowers who has figured in the role of newspaper editor school fund thief etc we believe that he is on his way to the mines in which case the honest miners had better look sharp else sam will bilk them sure i expressed a little surprise to the friend who had introduced me oh was the reply that's nothing sam perhaps ain't much on the prey but still he's not such a bad coon but he differs in politics with the folks in this quarter watch the umatilla and other up-river papers and see what they say i did watch them with this result that the paper in the next village on the river above the dales after a fashion very common in the western newspapers i suppose for the sake of filling up copied out the item with the commentary sam passed through here the other day nothing missing 
to which the next weekly adds sam passed through here on thursday but as far as we can learn without injury to the portable property of any of our citizens there was talk about a child's rattle and a red-hot stove but we believe the rumour was without foundation so another editor apologizes to another for calling him a miserable thing he meant a nothing and the editor of the solano press calls his brother of the herald an absurd ass a contemptible cur a dirty dog and a liar equally parliamentary is the language of the oregon statesman in reference to a contemporary we republish to-day a vile degraded infamous and execrably atrocious lie from the columns of the daily oregonian next week when time and space will permit we shall reply to it for the present suffice it for the low vulgar foul-mouthed and unrefined hound to know that our eye is upon him and he cannot escape us the solano press is apparently of a fierce nostril and anxious for a fight woe betide the unfortunate white who differs with it in opinion even though the opinion be not political but on the serious business of the best route to a certain mining locality i remember a newspaper correspondent as harmless a man as need be i well know who ventured to hint that there was a better route to the idaho mines than by passing up the columbia his advice if followed would be to the detriment of the columbia river towns with what unanimity was he abused no attempt was made at argument it was the old endorsement of the brief no defence abuse plaintiff's attorney the oregonian suggested that some charitable packer footnote muleteer who packs or carries goods to the mines or elsewhere end footnote some charitable packer had given him the privilege of riding the bell mare and had generously offered him a blanket to cover his miserable carcass the last i heard of this unfortunate young man was the suggestion of the umatilla tri-weekly advertiser that the flunkey must have lingered along the road scouring knives and washing dishes that he never paid for a meal is evident from his statement of the prices charged etc etc here below is a piece of fine writing from an editorial in a californian mining paper let vagabonds howl and traitors hiss let the breeders of bloodhounds to track and tear union refugees bay like their own dogs let the smitten maniacs who cursed johnson till he turned traitor also vomit new blasphemies against the holy name of liberty let foul lust and lazy pride and insolent and testy spleen and self-conscious envy and gleaming hate and blear-eyed prejudice and besotted ignorance and porcine brutality stir every cesspool with their asinine vociferations until every club-room of democracy reeks like an omnium gatherum of stenches i regret to say that many of these gems of far western periodical literature are occasionally not only scurrilous on the individual attacked but verge on the sacred precincts of the family circle holding up to public scorn the foibles and weakness of the female members of the family of the individual attacked and even occasionally being so openly coarse and indecent as to preclude their being noticed in this place probably no one likes when running for the honourable office of congressman or supreme state judge to have it shown in a newspaper how in an early portion of his career he murdered his grandmother and ignominiously buried her in the back kitchen mr artemus ward himself a quondam newspaper man has exactly struck this nail on the head when he represents in the controversy about a plank road this attack upon the editor of the eagle of freedom the passage is worth quoting as an epitome of a system quote, the road may be as our contemporary says a humbug but our aunt isn't bald-headed and we haven't got a one-eyed sister sal wonder if the editor of the eagle of freedom sees it this used up the eagle of freedom feller because his aunt's head does present a skinned appearance and his sister sarah is very much one-eyed we have recently put up in our office an entirely new sink of unique construction with two holes through which the soiled water may pass to the new bucket underneath 
what will the hell-hounds of the advertiser say to this we shall continue to make improvements as fast as our rapidly increasing business may warrant wonder whether a certain editor's wife thinks she can palm off a brass watch-chain on the community for a gold one End quote. a paper in vancouver island used to style its evening contemporary the night cart though a vast portion of a western newspaper might without a very great stretch of adverse criticism be styled personal yet by emphasis in the local item column you can see every now and then paragraphs entitled personal these paragraphs refer to the business of private individuals in contradistinction to others relating to the public wheel what they are may be judged by the following personal welcoming home of a prominent citizen mr joe Tritch arrived home last night with the stage he has on a new suit of state clothes including a fine plug hat he looks the doggone discuss ever since jim ford left but nevertheless we are glad to see him and hope he will settle down and behave himself the following is peculiarly national in its curiosity nathan e wallace and charlie henry went up to fort langley last night business unknown as might be expected such personalities occasionally lead to hostile encounters between rival editors and their readers most frequently these consist only in a thrashing on either side and i fancy very few western editors have missed having a difficulty of that sort at one time or another on their hands i possess a scrapbook kept by mr b griffin of victoria in the earlier years of california and such items as the following are not unfrequent collision between h a de courcy esq editor of the calaveras chronicle and mr w h carter affair of honor between w h jones and seleucius t slingsby editorial difficulty down at santa clara man shot etc john king of william editor of the san francisco herald was shot by a rowdy whom he had attacked in his paper his death may be said to have been the origin of the vigilance committee which with a lawless justice created comparative peace and order where anarchy and villainy had reigned i heard a story about a new editor who had come to a place which was infested with a gang of ruffians before his face was generally known he attacked those men most violently in his paper one day as he was sitting in his office after having published a particularly severe article a stalwart individual brandishing a whip in his hand rushed in and inquired for the editor suspecting evil he asked the visitor to be seated and he would call the editor who had just stepped out for a minute on his way downstairs he met a second individual carrying a bludgeon and likewise inquiring vigorously for the editor oh sir he is sitting in his office upstairs you'll find him there when he next peeped into the office the two were belaboring each other thoroughly rolling over and over and each fancying that he had the editor in hand i tell the story for what it is worth and do not pretend to guarantee its exact truth doolittle a southern editor held his post for six months and in that time was stabbed twice shot three times belabored with a bludgeon once thrown into a pond once but was never kicked during his six months experience he killed two of his adversaries all these are absolute facts when isaac disraeli wrote the quarrels and calamities of authors he must assuredly have known nothing of western newspaper life otherwise a chapter ought to have been added to both books as a set-off the local of the memphis bulletin jestingly sums up his year's experience as follows been asked to drink eleven thousand three hundred ninety three drank eleven thousand three hundred ninety two requested to retract four hundred and sixteen didn't retract four hundred and sixteen invited to parties receptions presentations etc by people fishing for puffs three thousand three hundred and thirty three took the hint thirty three didn't take the hint three thousand three hundred threatened to be whipped a hundred and seventy four been whipped zero didn't come to time a hundred and seventy 
been promised bottles of champagne whisky brandy gin bitters etc if i would go after them three thousand six hundred and fifty been after them zero going again zero been asked what's the news three hundred thousand told thirteen didn't know two hundred thousand lied about it ninety thousand nine hundred and eighty seven been to church two changed politics thirty two expected to change still thirty three gave for charity five dollars gave for a terrier dog twenty three dollars cash on hand zero everybody advertises in the west professional men as well as tradesmen and it is mainly owing to this extensive advertising business that so many of the local newspapers subsist it is always expected that the editor should call attention in the body of the paper to the advertisement when first inserted and accordingly you continually see such notices as the following we call our readers attention to the auction of boots and shoes by our fellow citizen washington hubs which appears in our advertising columns this day wash is pretty tonguey and generally persuades folks to buy or our readers will observe that messrs caleb johnston and company have opened a restaurant on the corner of jackson and fremont street footnote in sacramento the streets are named a to b and first second third and so on monotonous no doubt but still a relief to the everlasting washington jackson fremont kearney etc streets End note. on the corner of jackson and fremont street where the tallest sort of feeding may be had at all hours at the lowest possible cost to the spondulix money we advise our friends to give caleb a call advertisements of hotels with an initial letter of a noah's ark-like house or of mule and horse dealers and hirers figure extensively what would the london times say to the following which i cut from the idaho statesman footnote june thirteenth eighteen sixty five in footnote the advertiser is apparently aggrieved on the head of some rivals running an unfair competition with him quote, opposition is the life of business work for nothing and find yourself mr r and i am with you and you damned old rascal here we go horses kept to hay per night one dollar saddle horses per day one dollar two horses for buggy per day two fifty oats per pound five call any time day or night a new era wool mattresses in grand ronde valley oregon prices reduced the cheapest house in the burg all the creature comforts to be had at our house as they can be had anywhere on the sunny side of the blue mountains are you hungry come to our house are you thirsty take a drink are you weary try one of my mattresses are you sad i will condole with you are you glad i will rejoice with you if you are mad i will go out and spar with you come and see me End quote outside hotel keepers are every now and then calling the miners attentions to their square meals by which is meant full meals in contradistinction to the imperfect dinner a man has to put up with on the mountains men who wish to buy timber are referred to this solemn announcement of the fact of some timber being for sale Quote, grand benefit of salem marion county oregon from and after this date we propose to sell lumber lays and slabs as cheap as any other high-toned mill in the country times are changed and we have changed the credit of one year and returned to ready pay without which no webfoot need apply footnote webfoot a slang phrase after an inhabitant of the rainy valley of the willamette End footnote bookkeeping is most effectually played out you that owe come to our office there's the place and settle now we cannot afford to wait and when we commence to done we never get done be wise to-day tis folly to delay End quote. queer people follow all sorts of queer businesses out west a classical scholar was keeping a hotel in victoria vancouver island as might be inferred from his advertisements which used to be interlarded with greek and latin quotations from aeschylus plato horace oppian and ovid sometimes the newspapers contain an ominous warning from the city marshal to certain suspicious characters to get up and dust 
or an announcement of some indignant individual who has been paid in greenbacks instead of gold as is customary all over the pacific still notwithstanding the depreciated currency with the heading spot him spot him spot him the following melancholy advertisement is culled from an oregon paper will the gentleman who stole my melons on last sabbath night be generous enough to return me a few of the seeds as they were a very rare variety marriages are expected to be or at least are accompanied with some guerdon to the printers at the end of these announcements you generally see something like the following our staff returns thanks for their present and drank the happy couple's health in flowing bumpers of champagne the present consists almost always of a few bottles of champagne as no charge is made for such announcements in the local papers typographical errors are always troublesome and a western paper is usually distinguished for their number and variety occasionally these errors become matter of considerable difficulty to the editor and add one more responsibility to many others for instance a friend of mine got into a little trouble that way in a weak moment he agreed to conduct the weekly paper in a mining village for the editor who was called off on other business all went well until a leading man among the miners brought in an obituary of his deceased wife who was about the only white woman in the village now as items are scarce it was sent straight to the printer on revising the proof my friend found that it read she was distinguished for her virtue and benevolence he concluded that the husband must have meant virtues a proof was accordingly dispatched to the husband with a request to correct it and send it to the printer my friend went to bed early next morning he was roused by an acquaintance with a paper in his hand informing him that jim so-and-so the author of the obituary aforesaid was hunting him i e the editor all over town now as hunting a man means in the west going through all the drinking shops with a huge revolver in hand shouting where is he my friend had just reason for alarm and inquired what in the world he was being hunted for oh was the reply fun is all right but you know that item about old mother blank was a little too much she mightn't be just the correct thing but still jim thought a sight of her it was some time before the temporary editor could understand what was meant until the paper was shown him with the obituary intimating that mrs blank was distinguished for her virtue question mark and her benevolence the husband knew nothing about a proof and the printer had treated the query as an editor's correction after considerable difficulty the indignant husband was consoled and peace was made over drinks in the nearest saloon errors of context are not unfrequent thus the san diego paper announces that the schooner general harney had just arrived in the harbor with no passengers but nathan brown who owns half the cargo and the captain's wife or that there was lost a valuable new silk umbrella belonging to a gentleman with a curiously carved head sometimes the make-up of the paper is a little out of joint thus it was rather a mistake savouring of grim humour to put the arrangements for a police commissioner's funeral under the head of rural sports paying in advance is always one of the cardinal virtues in the subscriber to any periodical but perhaps the pious editor of the christian index need not have announced so prominently that but a week since we recognized the death of an old father in the church a careful reader of the index and who paid for three papers in advance in a country where every year thousands of immigrants from the southwestern states arrive over the plains and the rocky mountains full of stories of indian fights and chock full of alkali a good itemizer of such matters is important accordingly we find announced that we have engaged the services of an immigrant editor to whom is entrusted all matters connected with engines fights and alkalied subjects utah editors notwithstanding the presence of the saints are rather profane fellows one of them heads his leader with the startling title of hell boiling again english newspaper readers would be rather surprised to find some morning their favourite organ printed on brown packing-paper by reason of the office having run short of the usual paper 
i have seen this more than once in vancouver island again the chronicle a paper published in the same english colony off the northwest coast of america worth stating as its whereabouts seems only to be known to a few f r g s s announces in a paper before me that owing to the market being bare of paper of the usual size we shall be compelled to appear in a reduced form until the arrival of the mail steamer active with a supply again the same paper on one occasion appeared with one side blank accompanied by an explanatory note that owing to an accident the composed matter got disarranged and as there was no more time to set it up again our readers will please excuse the blank page letters to the paper are not addressed as in england to the editor of blank but editors stump city gazette and commencing messrs editors some of these papers are edited by women and in the controversy about women's rights it is worthy of remark that the feminine editorials are not the least truculent of the literary efforts especially in times of political contest when one of the sterner sex ventures to raise the lady's virtuous indignation a female editor announces that being a woman she cannot take satisfaction of the low-lived hound who wrote the article in our contemporary over the way but she has a little boy who will clean him out handsomely in about two minutes generally just before an election contest fresh papers are started to advocate particular views and it is then that the western paper is seen in all its glory it is rampant and scatters slaughter on every side on the whole i think that the most objectionable feature i observed in the western newspaper system is the custom of deadheading that is of the editors going free on railway steamers stages and even paying their hotel bill and livery stable keeper by praising the gentlemanly and high-toned proprietor i know that many papers will not permit of this system the new york legislature passed an act for abolishing and forbidding the deadhead system as far as possible taking them all in all though the western papers may be rough in their language yet with rare exceptions they are always decent they may be rude in their humour but their rudeness differs as much from the double entendre of the low class of city papers as much as the honest clay of their own prairie lands differs from the slime of the street on the whole they work for good and if their literature be not very refined neither are their readers so if it do not civilize them neither does it suffer them to remain barbarous as they would be very apt to be in the rude society of the remote far western glens End of part one. part two of the american far west seven mid nineteenth century views from abroad by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain part two far western judges and juries in the united states and indeed also in canada there is no distinction between barrister and attorney and in the newer settlements to become either requires little study it used to be said that in some parts of oregon all a man had to do to be admitted an attorney was to go round for some time with a law-book under his arm and talk constitution in front of grocery doors a gentleman of oregon gave me a copy of a legal document preserved in the archives of marion county oregon and written by an attorney i knew the man regularly licensed to practice it is a demurrer to a complaint in an action in which marion county is the plaintiff and one g b wagnon defendant brought for the recovery of a fine for violating a statute in the disposition of stray animals part of it runs precisely thus quote, and now comes g b wagnon the 
definite in the bove suit or cause and files a dem warrer and says that the plaintiff should not have nor maintain his action against said defendant for the following says there is not that plain and concise statement of the facts constituting the cause of action as there is no description of collier marks nor brands nor by whom sprayed and further says that he was not served with a certified copy of said complaint therefore the defendant prays this honourable court to dismiss the above suit this eighteenth day of december eighteen fifty nine end quote another attorney delivered a famous defence of a man who was caught in the act of stealing a hank of cotton yarn it ran something like this quote, gentlemen of the jury do you think my client thomas flynn off muddy creek and the big willamette would be guilty of stealing a hank of cotton yarn gentlemen of the jury i reckon not i s'pose not by no manner of means gentlemen not at all he are not guilty tom flynn good heavens gentlemen you all know tom flynn and an honour now gentlemen do you think he'd do it no gentlemen i s'pose not i reckon not thomas flynn why warming up with virtuous indignation why great snakes and alligator tom's a whole team on muddy creek and a hoss to let and insinuatingly do you think he'd sneak off with a miserable hank of cotton yarn well gentlemen i reckon not i s'pose not when the wolves was a howlin gentlemen on the mountings of oregon and the millishing was a fightin of the indians on rogue river do you think gentlemen my client thomas flynn esq could be guilty o a hookin yes hookin gentlemen that pitiful low mean hank o cotton yarn on possible gentlemen i reckon i know my client mr thomas finn he's got the fastest nag and a purtiest sister gentlemen in all muddy creek and the big willamette that gentlemen are a fact yes gentlemen that are a fact you can just bet on that gentlemen yes gentlemen you can just bet your bones on that now pon honour gentlemen do you think he are guilty gentlemen i reckon i s'pose not why gentlemen indignantly beginning to believe it himself my client mr thomas flynn am no more guilty of stealin that ere hunk o cotting yarn than a toad has got a tail yes a tail gentlemen than a toad has got a tail End quote. verdict for defendant case dismissed and court adjourned to whisky up at the late prisoner's expense little as such law may be worth it is surprising with what alacrity a young community of miners or backwoodsmen will attempt to form some organization for the preservation of order according to law and how naturally they proceed to elect a magistrate or judge out of their number this desire proceeds in part from a wish to preserve order and in part from the all-engrossing passion for voting holding conventions and caucuses and electing somebody to hold some office or other with the usual amount of speechifying and drinking an old gentleman with whom i passed many pleasant evenings on the walls of panama in days gone by described to me his recollection of a court-room in a western state it was a rough log building with a bar of unhewn timber stretched across it this was the bar of justice behind it was a table with a jar of molasses a bottle of vinegar and a jug of water to make switchel for the court time ten a m enter sheriff judge who is paring his corns after the manner of the venerable judge mcalmond of san francisco who was in the habit of paring his corns while the business of the court was going on and generally sat with his heels tilted up in front of him wow mr sheriff do you think we'll get a jury to-day nah judge jurymen are rather scarce to-day but i got eleven men corralled under a black walnut tree outside and my niggers are hunting down a twelfth i reckon we'll have a jury in about half an hour and so the sheriff proceeds to liquor and the judge continue paring his corns until the court opens i was assured by a former chief justice of one of the states on the western slope of the rocky mountains that the first grand jury he ever charged were sitting on the prairie under a tree 
and there was not a man of them that had on any other footgear but moccasins and i know a judge who in the earlier days of california when everybody was bound to make money sat on the bench in the morning mined during the day and played the fiddle in a whiskey shop at night the county judge of madison county in washington territory does or did run the gang saw in the port madison mills in these judges we often find the notion of law not very defined though which is more important that of equity is strong a most notorious rowdy from new england who had escaped the law several times was at last captured in the act of smashing the interior of a chinese house of ill fame in the little village of eureka in northern california evidence against him was rather weak and it was feared he would again escape but when the prisoner was brought into court his honour burst upon him with a tirade of abuse eh you long leather lanterjawed yankee cuss we've catched ye eh? at last i'll commit him at once but judge whispered the clerk you'll have to hear the evidence evidence be blowed was the rejoinder wasn't i thar and seated all myself judge p was holding a term of the district court in the village of corvallis in the then territory of oregon his court was held in a common log-house with a large open fireplace and a few rough heavy benches that had never known plain an indictment was found against one charlie sandborn for selling whisky at retail although he had no license he stood at one side of the fireplace with his hands deep in his pockets the judge sat upon the end of a school bench on the other side of the fire when required to plead guilty or not guilty charlie threw himself on the mercy of the court the judge then sentenced him to pay the lowest fine and costs at the close of the sentence by way of personal palliation his lordship remarked that while it was the duty of the court to enforce the laws as it found them on the statute book the person of the court was not inimical to men who sold whisky there is in idaho territory a judge who is well known as alec smith a woman brought suit in his court for divorce and had the discernment to select a particular friend of her own who stood well with the judge as her attorney one morning the judge called up the case and addressing himself to the attorney for the complainant said mr h i don't think people ought to be compelled to live together where they don't want to and i will decree a divorce in this case mr h bowed blandly thereupon the judge turning to another attorney whom he took to be the counsel for the defendant said mr m i suppose you have no objection to the decree mr m nodded assent but the attorney for the defendant was another mr m not then in court presently he came in and finding that his client had been divorced without a hearing began to remonstrate alec listened a moment then interrupted saying mr m it is too late the court has pronounced the decree of divorce and the parties are no longer man and wife but if you want to argue the case right bad the court can marry them over again and give you a crack at it i was at clear lake when an irishman named jerry mccarthy was tried in the county court on a charge of whipping his wife a point of law was raised by the attorney for the defence as to the admissibility of certain evidence offered by the district attorney judge j h thompson for it is judge once judge always and the court called upon the attorney to produce his authorities to sustain his position the attorney being rather slow in finding the law in point the court just as he had found it and was rising to read it ruled that the evidence was not admissible the deuce you do hallooed the district attorney say judge i read you the law and bet you a thousand dollars i'm right i'll send you to jail for twenty-four hours for contempt of court cried the judge send to jail and be hanged cried the district attorney i know my rights and intend to maintain them the judge then called out sheriff Krigler, Krigler, sheriff take judge thompson to jail and adjourn court four and twenty hours Krigler advanced to obey the order but halted upon seeing the district attorney put himself into a position at the same time shouting loud enough to be heard all over the town that neither Krigler nor any other man should carry him to jail to make things sure the sheriff called for a commitment 
but while this was being prepared mutual apologies passed between the court and the district attorney and the order was revoked the court was then adjourned for a quarter of an hour to allow according to custom made and provided in such cases of drinks being exchanged after which the trial proceeded to its result in the acquittal of the defendant if all stories be true occasionally the court adjourns in less favoured districts to allow antagonistic attorneys to fight out with their fists what couldn't be settled by their tongues i witnessed once not in a rough american territory but in the british town of victoria vancouver island a stand-up fight between the honourable the attorney-general and a client of the opposite party in a suit and not long afterwards two of the most prominent of the members of the colonial parliament engaged in a like encounter i mention this lest it might be unjustly supposed that these eccentricities are found exclusively in border parts of the united states one summer afternoon i happened to pass through a frontier village in by no means the newest state of the pacific settlements while my horse was baiting hearing that the supreme court was in session i strolled in after passing up a rickety chair thickly sprinkled with saliva cigar ends and sawdust where the rough unplaned board walls were scrawled over with likenesses of judge this and judge that and remarks upon them personally politically and judicially i entered by a rickety old door a plastered room with a whitewashed board ceiling but very dirty and a floor covered with sawdust on a few forms scattered through the room lolled some citizens half asleep they turned round at the sound of my jingling mexican spurs but finding that i was only a rough fellow with a buckskin shirt on lolled back again and dozed off to sleep until aroused by some particular burst of eloquence from the lips of a linen-coated lawyer who was speaking furiously on the jumping of a mining claim when anything particular seized the fancy of the citizens they would applaud in a lazy manner and once or twice an enthusiastic miner in gum-boots with his cheek distended by an enormous chaw of tobacco shouted bully good again and that's so judge but he was i am glad to say instantly quashed though only partially put down for he would still breathe out in a lower tone bully good on your head and so on and explained to me in a stage whisper the peculiar merits of the case in which it would seem he was interested for he was the only person present who cared anything about the proceedings except the lawyer's voice and the whispering of his excited client there was no noise in the court but the fall of a disused quid or the squirting of tobacco juice the lawyers sat at a horseshoe table at one end of the room most of them sound asleep with their chairs tilted back and their heels on the table before them in front of them on a raised platform sat a gentleman without a waistcoat but with a long and rather dusty brown linen coat over a somewhat dirty white shirt without a collar he too had his legs up in front of him and was likewise chewing tobacco with a slow motion of his leathery jaws for the heat of the day and the somniferous character of the proceedings seemed to have disposed him to sleep like everybody else now and then he would incline his head but only to squirt the rejected juice between his legs sometimes when the lawyer indulged in unbecoming language in reference to the court he would start up and in the excitement of the moment miss his aim and squirt over among the sleepy counsel finally he had to charge the jury which he did in a very sensible and thoroughly legal manner he was a good lawyer and had been attentive to the case however in my eyes it detracted a little from his honour's dignity to see him take the half-used quid from his mouth and hold it between his thumb and forefinger while he charged in the course of the evening i had a chance of making very close acquaintance with his honour the little village hotel was crowded with an unwanted concourse of lawyers and jurymen and when i made up my mind to stay over the night the proprietor there are no landlords in america informed me that he reckoned judge blank had the only single bed and if i liked to put in with him i could get to stay somehow 
not wishing to inconvenience his honour i preferred to pass the night in my own blanket on the stoop or porch of the building i have seen a judge who is said in pursuance of his duty as a magistrate to have fined a man twenty-five dollars for shooting at another but who also swayed by his feelings as a man moulted the other in the same figure for not shooting back again at the caribou gold mines in british columbia lives a well-known irish gold commissioner whose common-sense decisions have gained great reputation throughout that section of country on one occasion two mining companies came before him with some dispute one swore one way and the other swore the exactly opposite way the judge was nonplussed look here boys at last was his sage decision there's no use you going to law about it there's some hard swearing somewhere where i won't pretend to say you say this and they say that i am produce witnesses too what am i to do of course if you insist i'll come to a decision but i honestly confess it will be only a toss-up i tell you what's the best thing to do you know my shanty down the creek all shouted in the affirmative well in that shanty there's a bottle of prime whisky in which i will be happy to drink luck to both of you now the first man there gets the suit go out of the court they rushed down the creek over logs and over mining flumes tumbling and rolling and running with half the population after them until they reached the cabin in question when the judge arrived shortly afterwards he found a stalwart miner firmly grasping the handle of the door the whisky was produced luck was drunk and everybody went away perfectly satisfied with the decision most commendable on the whole is the patience evinced by these judges under the orations of long-winded and not very learned attorneys the most extraordinary instance of patience was that of a judge in illinois who after two wordy lawyers had argued and re-argued about the meaning of a certain act of congress closed the whole at the end of the second day by calmly remarking gentlemen the act is repealed mr judge begley of british columbia the terror of evil-doers and of two sympathizing jurors had occasion to caution a witness don't prevaricate sir don't prevaricate remember that you are on oath the excuse was how can i help it judge when i have such a almighty bad toothache if the learning of the judge puzzles the witness sometimes the dog latin of the lawyers puzzles a judge a short time ago in san francisco a hotly contested case came on in a certain justice's court in the city which is presided over by a magistrate with a strong antipathy to the dead languages and all who indulge in the affectation of using them plaintiff having put in his complaint in due form the judge demanded what was the defendant's answer whereupon the defendant's counsel who had been brought up under the old system and still had a lingering love for scraps of law latin responded may it please the court our answer is that the same subject matter and cause of action in this suit was the subject matter and cause of action in a previous suit already determined in consequence of which the question now raised before your honour is res adjudicata is what cried the judge adjusting his spectacles res adjudicata if the court pleases sir roared the judge we allow no dead languages here plain english is good enough for us the practice has abolished the dead languages and if you give me any more of your greek or latin i'll commit you sir for contempt of this court in the early days of california one of these rough and ready dispensers of the law held a court on a sunday and sentenced a greaser a native californian or mexican according to the law then in force to thirty-nine lashes for theft but on the prisoner's counsel threatening to apply for a writ of habeas corpus on the ground that it was unconstitutional to hold a court on a sunday the judge declared with a round oath that rather than the blessed greaser should get off by any such pettifogging trick he would carry the sentence into effect right away and then and there he applied the thirty-nine lashes the law limiting them to under forty remarking when he had finished that the lawyer had better reserve his habeas corpus until the greaser's back had barked again the missouri sheriff might truly enough remark that jurymen air rather scarce 
more than once a friend who knew the ways of the country has informed me as a kindness that there war a blessed jury trial a gwine on down to Huntington city as i reckon the sheriff's darned run for jurymen you'd better kind of work around clar o that locality if i asked how can i be a juryman i am a foreigner a stranger a traveller who has neither land nor lot neither votes nor pays taxes ah that would be mighty little count would be the reply you have paid taxes for you paid your head money and as for not being a resident i reckon the sheriff will soon make you out a resident and as for your being a furriner it don't matter shucks that's the very thing you'll be spotted for the sheriff has summoned every citizen to coroners and jury trials and every other darn sort of trial so mighty often that they swore if summoned much oftener they won't vote for him next election and as lection comes on in march i sort of reckon he'll like to corral a coon or two who ain't got no vote at last i really was caught and it was useless to remonstrate the sheriff declared jurymen were scarce and i must take a turn at it to my astonishment under the idea i suppose that i was a right smart chance of a scholar i was chosen foreman of the jury and in this capacity assisted in sending a man to the state's prison for two months as a reward for his mechanical skill having been diverted into the channel of making bogus gold dust we had considerable difficulty in arriving at a unanimous verdict as two of the jury were personal friends of the prisoner in this stage a backwoodsman producing a pack of cards from his pocket proposed that we should play seven up for a decision or if we objected to gambling we could at least draw straws for it at a little backwood sawmill settlement called alberni vancouver island an indian had been stealing potatoes from a farm belonging to mr sproat the local justice and in order to frighten this indian the man in charge who was a western backwoodsman fired his gun vaguely in the potato field direction to his astonishment he shot the native dead an inquest had to be held the woodman of course looked upon a slain indian as a very light affair and several came to mr sproat and said you're not going to trouble henry about this are you sir mr sproat being not only master but a magistrate had only to reply that however much he felt for a man's misfortune he must let the law take its course but where was a surgeon to be found to make a post-mortem examination a careworn-looking man stepped off a pile of lumber where he was working and said he was a surgeon this statement being naturally received with some hesitation he produced from an old army chest his commission his degree and ample proof of not only having been a medical man but of once having been a staff surgeon he soon produced a pea from the lung and showed that the indian had died from gunshot wounds in the chest evidence was produced in corroboration one of the witnesses testifying that the prisoner had said jack i've shot an indian the judge laid down their duty to the jury which was composed of twelve of the most intelligent of the workmen and they were sent into another room for their finding it was nearly half an hour before they returned the foreman then said we find the siwash was worried by a dog footnote siwash corrupted from the voyageurs sauvage a savage universally applied to indians on the north pacific coast End note a what the judge exclaimed worried by a dog sir said another juryman fearing that the foreman had not spoken clearly assuming a proper expression of magisterial gravity his worship pointed out to the jury the incompatibility of their finding with the evidence and again went over the points of the case calling particular attention to the medical evidence and the production by the doctor of the pea found in the body of the indian after which he a second time dismissed the jury to their room and begged them to come back with some verdict reasonably connected with the facts of the case they were away longer than before when they at length sidled back into the room for the second time the judge drew a paper towards him to record their finding now men what do you say their decisive answer was we say he was killed by falling over a cliff the judge shuffled his papers together and told the jurymen they might go to their work and he would return a verdict for them himself 
for a full mile every way from where the dead body was found the country was as level as a table this jury was not so conscientious as another composed of the friends of some people accused of stealing pork we find the defendants not guilty but we believe they hooked the pork end of part two part three of the american far west seven mid nineteenth century views from abroad by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain part three far western lawgivers and preachers of course there must be a legislature as soon as a rude territory is organized and somebody must run for it and somebody be elected in all the divisions to sit in the local parliament and all who are so chosen have the title of honourable indeed it seems as if in these parts of the world every government official except the policeman has this handle to his name it does not always follow that these honourables are the worthiest men to be had any more that it always follows that honourable members of the british parliament comprise the flower of our british intellect but one thing is certain in the west at least and probably over the whole of america that the legislature is almost sure to contain the wordiest members of society for to speak or make a few remarks on something is absolutely indispensable to a western man in the wilder parts of the settlements members of legislature have often been elected not so much for their talents as for being good hands at poker or great at a spree and one of these the honourable gentleman from mariposa on getting up to speak in the california legislature and essaying several times without much effect was greeted with shouts of get out oh get out they mistook their man however for as one of his supporters remarked before his election ain't much on the speak but just get him mad once and he'll give em fits look ye here gentlemen he remarked cocking a derringer pistol ye may holler get out get out as long as god'll let ye but my speech is already begun and the next man who shouts get out in the house will bring to his ears the ominous clicking of small arms what is it the gentlemen wish and what would they have is my life so dear or my peace so sweet that it must be purchased at the expense of incapacitating a few on ye for military service no siree i know not what course others would take but as for me i will finish my speech or there'll be a dead senator found round these premises in about fifteen seconds by the clock he was allowed to finish at his leisure the late dr henry formerly surveyor-general of washington territory among the many genial stories he used to tell and which still keep his memory green had one at the expense of his territorial legislature a hotel-keeper in one of the fashionable towns in the eastern states used to stand at the head of the table and read out the bill of fare in what the elocution teachers called a clear articulate voice though there was a printed cart on the table this irritated his aristocratic customers until at last one said say cap why do you read out the bill of fare do you think we can't read oh gentlemen was the reply you will excuse me i hope it is solely the force of habit i once kept a hotel in washington territory and most of the legislator boarded with me and i'm blessed if half em could read or write it is a matter of history that when the convention met to form a constitution for california and on the usual preamble being read that all men should be judged by a jury of their peers an oregonian who happened to be a delegate moved to the great amusement of the other members that the word peers should be struck out this weren't a monarchy there weren't no peers in this here state disgraceful scenes of drunkenness are sometimes seen in these legislatures but in this they do not stand alone one of the californian members of the united states senate is distinguished as the sober senator such a virtue being rather uncommon in the present congressman from that state corruption in these state legislatures prevails to a frightful extent and is so open that newspapers will even have the hardihood to give a list of the sums paid to each senator for his vote in the more refined states official embezzlements are styled pickings 
but in the far west and pacific states plain english suffices and they are well known as stealings more than once prominent government officials have asked me while in social intercourse how much salary i got for such an office i would tell them well would be the reply that ain't much for this country but of course you have got your little stealings i was naturally rather inclined to resent the insinuation of robbing my government or employers of any sort until they would assure me that they meant no harm it was the regular thing there everybody did it why sir do you think i can support my family on fifteen hundred dollars a year in greenbacks at sixty cents to the dollar or that i would come up to this one-horse place after having a practice as a lawyer in frisco of ten thousand dollars a year for that i guess not all members of these legislatures are paid and get also a certain mileage or travelling expense from their homes to the seat of government this recompense or per diem as they call it varies from about ten dollars to fifteen dollars a day and is generally paid in the pacific states in gold the mileage is about twenty-five cents a mile now this to a congressman travelling from washington territory idaho oregon or california comes up to a very round sum and indeed is looked upon as their principal pay always exclusive of the little stealings formerly mentioned the local legislatures are limited by the state constitution to a sitting of so many days and it would be well if the british colonial ones were under the same rule for their unpaid twaddle is endless and of course their pay only extends over that period sometimes they will finish their work in a much less time than the law allows for their sitting but they have no notion of rising while their pay is going on when not engaged in the anterooms of the senate hall in playing monte cutthroat poker ancre or seven up they can pass the time in introducing bogus or sham bills generally a divorce for some of their own number or a rule to show why another should not change his name the wit and decency of which i am told are very much in the style of an institution once presided over in london by chief baron nicholson when oregon was poor and humble her rough names for her rivers and towns were good enough for them but when she got rich a bill was gravely introduced to change these names rogue river was to be called gold river gold just then being found on its banks and so forth it would probably have passed had not another supplemental bill been introduced which provided that jump off joe should be called walk along joseph that greaser's camp should be called the halls of montezuma that shirt-tail bar should be styled carraza beach and so on this fairly laughed the whole proposal out of court though indeed on the official map an attempt was made to keep up some of these elegant appellations and to indianize the more outrageous of the names in the way of legislative joking it is a well-known fact that when a bill was introduced into the georgia legislature to lay a tax of ten dollars a head upon all donkeys a jocular member proposed to amend it so as to include lawyers and doctors which amendment was passed amid loud applause various attempts have been made to repeal the clause but in vain and to this day a tax of ten dollars is levied upon all jackasses lawyers and doctors in the far west as elsewhere there are legislators who are not too much in earnest i recommend to some of our present candidates for british suffrages the following noble close to a far western election address gentlemen said the candidate after having given his sentiments on the constitution the monroe doctrine and such like topics gentlemen and he put his hand on the region of his heart these are my sentiments the sentiments gentlemen of a honest man i a honest politician but gentlemen and fellow-citizen if they don't suit you they can be altered to appear a plain sort of a man on these electioneering tours is quite as necessary as the old-world baby-kissing and shaking hands with the washed men provided by your agent are with us i know a western senator who keeps what he calls his stumping suit hodden gray well-worn but whole shoes patched but brightly polished a shirt spotlessly clean but frayed at the edges of the seams 
and a hat which has seen better days but in its well-brushed condition quite keeps up the air its owner is striving to assume humble but honest after a campaign is over the suit is carefully put aside until another election in which its owner is interested the worthy senator who is rather a dandy than otherwise has filled every office from governor to hog weave and considers that his suit of humble but honest won him many a vote money wouldn't buy it he told me it ain't for sale nohow it is commonly supposed that general fremont lost his elections out west by dividing his hair down the middle the hon samuel m has often assured me that on his first candidature for office in oregon territory certain of the baser sort voted agin him because of his puttin on airs in respect of wearin a white shirt or as they irreverently styled it a boiled rag i have put the state in the far west before the church for the church there is of the future although every place is not like josephine county where i was told with a sort of depraved pride there ain't nary preacher nor meetin house in this here county cap'n in other places where the preacher gets a footing it is sometimes easier to get a meetin house full than to get wherewith to support the labourer who is nowhere in the world more worthy of his hire a preacher in a frontier settlement had been collecting money for some church project there were still some twenty dollars wanting and after vain efforts to make up the deficiency he plainly intimated as he locked the church door one day after service that he intended to have that said twenty dollars before any of them left the house at the same time he set the example by tossing five dollars on the table another put down a dollar another a quarter of a dollar a fourth half a dollar and so on the parson read out every now and then the state of the funds thar's uh, seven and a half my friends thar's nine and a quarter ten and six bits are all that are in the hat friends and christian brethren slowly it mounted up twelve and a half fourteen fifteen sixteen and three bits and so on until it stuck at nineteen dollars and a half it only wants fifty cents friends to make up the amount will nobody make it up everybody has subscribed and not a cent more was forthcoming silence reigned and how long it might have lasted it was difficult to say had not a half dollar been tossed through the open window and a rough explanatory voice shouted here parson here's your money let out my gal i'm about tired of waitin on her the long tom creek region in oregon is settled by a very rough lot of people mostly from missouri they are even in oregon a proverb for the uncouth character of their manners and it was thought quite a missionary enterprise when a devoted young clergyman from the states came and settled among them church was a novelty with them it reminded them of old times in the states they built a little church in the middle of a broad prairie and for a time it was crowded every sunday the backwoodsmen and their families used to come to church in wagons and on horseback the men had on fringed buckskin breeches and moccasins of indian manufacture and the head covered with coonskin caps with the tail hanging in the form of a tassel behind they would tie their horses up to the long hitchin post in front of the church and always brought their rifles to church with them handy for any varmints which might cross their path going and coming it so happened one warm sunday that the church door was opened and a backwoodsman who happened to be near it was gazing vacantly out on the prairie in front suddenly he spied a deer close by quietly grazing here was a chance slowly he took his rifle from the corner of his pew and crept out his action was observed and one after another followed until nobody but a lame old man was left by this time the deer was ambling over the prairie and the whole congregation of men yelling and galloping in pursuit preaching was out of the question for even the women and children were as eager as the men watching the chase halfway over the prairie the old man and the preacher stood alone together at the door of the church the poor clergyman in despair for the souls of his people and thinking that he would have a sympathizer in the old man who alone had not joined in the chase sighingly said lost lost devil a bit of it sir devil a bit of it they'll catch it 
by jingo they've plugged it i knowed they would the young minister received a haunch and brought the services to a close but he was out of his element and soon went east again where he is in the habit of remarking with unnecessary acrimony that the oregonians are a very careless people in heavenly matters in the same part of the country at a place called coddle bridge i saw a deacon preach his sermon was not very remarkable for vigour but i can vouch for it that his squirting of tobacco juice over the pulpit rails was most forcible i had noticed that for some seats next the reading desk the pews were unoccupied though other parts of the church were crowded after what i witnessed i had no difficulty in accounting for the indisposition to sit under him too immediately if the parson is sometimes rough so are the parishioners at church in a little backwood settlement most of the congregation were asleep suddenly a half tipsy fellow made an apple bump on the bald head of one of the sleepers the preacher stopped and gave the offender an interrogative stare bile ahead parson bile ahead i'll keep him awake was the ready explanation the following incident has i think been told before but still it is so characteristic that it is worth repeating in california a miner had died in a mountain digging and being much respected his acquaintances resolved to give him a square funeral instead of putting the body in the usual way in any roughly made hole and saying by way of service for the dead thar goes another bully boy under they sought the services of a miner who bore the reputation of having at one time of his career been a powerful preacher in the states and then far western fashion all knelt around the grave while the extemporized parson delivered a prodigiously long prayer the miners tired of this unaccustomed opiate to while away the time began fingering the earth digger fashion about the grave gradually looks were exchanged whispering increased until it became loud enough to attract the attention of their parson he opened his eyes and stared at the whispering miners what is it boys then as suddenly his eyes lighted on sparkling scales of gold he shouted gold by jingo and the richest kind of diggins the congregations dismissed instantly every man began to prospect the new digging our clerical friend not being the least active of the number the body had to be removed and buried elsewhere but the memory of the incident yet lives in the name of the locality for dead man's gulch became one of the richest localities in california End of part three. Part four of the American Far West Seven Mid Nineteenth Century Views from Abroad by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four Far Western Gamblers. In Far Western society, it is no longer reputable to be known as a professional gambler yet men who remember the days when everybody played will be apt to look lightly upon the vice it is not uncommon therefore to see merchants especially american having a social game of cutthroat monte euchre or poker with piles of gold before them in the mountain towns it is still worse and the anterooms of the nevada and california legislators used to be a perfect carnival of gambling in the evenings and even during the day when they were not intent on gambling in the public wheel the tolerance of gambling and the widespread habit of betting show through many of the slang phrases in general use on the coast continually you will hear men and even women and children sometimes adding after making some positive assertion you bet or you bet your life or you bet your bones while to bet your boots is confirmation strong as holy writ in the mines at least a miner is always particular about his boots their form and durability and they are a common subject of conversation in the places where diggers most do congregate again nobody in the northwest will have any hesitation in telling you that such and such a statement is played out when he means to convey an imputation that you are somewhat beside the truth or that the proposals you may be making to him are not suitable to his ideas of things right and fitting if he further informs you that this has been played out since forty nine he means that since the first colonization of the pacific coast by smart men such a thing was never believed in 
1849 being the year of the commencement of the californian gold digging a vote being taken on an important measure in the indiana senate a grave and reverend senator who had not been attending to the biz at hand did not know what the question was when his name was called by the secretary he looked puzzled for a moment and then rapping the desk with his knuckles after the manner of card players said i pass an audible titter ran through the hall and the president of the senate took it up a divine in a far western state visited a distant town for the purpose of preaching the dedicatory sermon in a new church court was in session and on saturday the judge and lawyers congregated together in a room and amused themselves by card-playing and story-telling the divine at the request of a lawyer visited the room he came into the room so suddenly that they were unable to hide their cards and whiskey the divine looked on a while and then politely invited the gentleman present to attend church next day and hear him preach this they agreed to do and sunday found them judge and lawyers seated in the amen corner the sermon over the minister announced friends the citizens of this town have built a fine church there is still fifteen hundred dollars due we propose to raise the money by subscription to-day and eyeing the judge i go one hundred imitating the style of the gamblers of last night the judge glancing at the lawyers slowly responded i see your hundred thank you brother said the divine will any one raise it looking at the same time at attorney number one the lawyer saw that he was in for it and quietly replied i go a hundred blind and so on through the list the divine raked down both the bar and their money until the scene closed by a sharp shrill voice announcing i see the last hundred and call you the astonishment of the congregation can be imagined i venture however to think that these lawyers will not soon invite the divine to witness another social game of euchre when men see each other go it blind and call the hand i can vouch myself for the exact truth of that story the next i tell you from hearsay and don't answer for but as i have seen something very like it i believe it may be true at a far western court the case of smith v jones was called up who's for the plaintiff inquired the judge impatiently may it please the court said a rising member of the legal fraternity pilkins is for the plaintiff but i left him just now over in the tavern playing a game of poker he's got a sucker there and he is sure to skin him right smart if he has only time he's got everything all set to ring a cold deck in which case he'll deal for himself four aces and his opponent four queens so that your honour will perceive that he must rake the persimmons footnote a southern fruit but here of course applied to money an expressive western phrase is the longest pole will knock down the persimmons i e the longest head will win End note. dear me said the judge with a sigh that's too bad it happens at a very unfortunate time i am very anxious to get on with this case a brown study followed and at length a happy idea struck the judge bill said he addressing the friend of the absent pilkins who had just spoken you understand poker about as well as pilkins suppose you go over and play his hand and bill did it we have another phase of the gambling spirit in the extraordinary bets which are now and again recorded in the papers an old jew miser in san francisco being irritated on one occasion by jests at his love of money proposed that the man who was baiting him should go with him in a boat into the middle of the bay where for every twenty dollar gold piece the jew should toss overboard the other should toss over five dollars and let them see who would be first to cry hold both being excessively purse-proud the bet was accepted and the scene was witnessed by hundreds the jew's opponent was the first to save his dollars the gridley sack of flour which became glorious about the time of the american sanitary commission for the benefit of the wounded soldiers in the army was the effect of a bet and the story of its sale and resale is thoroughly illustrative of this wild extravagance there were two candidates for the mayoralty of the village of austin in nevada a city in the wildest part of the desert and not then two years old 
but with five thousand inhabitants each candidate had agreed if defeated to carry a sack of flour on his back from austin to a neighbouring village in broad day accordingly when mr r g gridley lost his election he prepared to fulfil his engagement headed by a band of music in a wagon leading his little boy clad in the national uniform by the hand and with a sack of flour on his back followed by a mongrel procession of miners and citizens mr gridley took up his foot journey to the appointed place arrived there the thought struck him that the gay spirits and patriotic feelings of the crowd which grew as he travelled might be turned to humane account he instantly proposed now to sell the sack of flour for the benefit of the sick and wounded in the army to the highest bidder the humour took the sack was sold and sold again netting five thousand dollars the amount realised fired the ingenious gridley with a resolve to make the most of his lucky idea accordingly he started for a journey of three hundred miles to virginia city with the sack of flour in company arriving on a sunday and finding a sanitary commission meeting going on in the theatre he proceeded to the place got admitted to the stage and there telling his story to the audience sold the sack to the audience for five hundred and eighty dollars the next morning having procured a band of music he proceeded to make a tour of the neighbouring towns gold hill silver city and dayton selling the sack wherever he could find bidders and adding the price labelled on the face of this more than fortunatus purse at gold hill the sack sold for five thousand eight hundred and twenty two dollars fifty cents at silver city for eight hundred and thirty dollars at dayton for eight hundred and seventy three dollars finally returning to virginia city again the sack putting forward all its attractions won a prodigious subscription of twelve thousand and twenty five dollars mr gridley pursuing his successful way arrived at sacramento just as a sanitary commission picnic was in progress in the midst of the festivities he marched into the crowd a band of music leading the way a stalwart negro walking by his side carrying the sack and an extempore procession following him which grew larger every moment and presented himself for new conquests to the officers of the day and the president of the commission notwithstanding the stimulus of patriotism and champagne the sack did not fare so well here as before but here several supplementary wrinkles of humour were suggested by the sack among others a good woman finding a small island of a few rods square in the swamp had erected a bridge of one plank and established such a rate of toll that to see nothing there cost the curiosity of some hundreds a half dollar each then the president of the commission was invited to shake hands with some hundreds of the company who bought the privilege at from fifty cents to a double eagle ten dollars a piece making his hat his till until it was literally half full of silver and gold carried thence to sacramento the sack was sold again at a public lecture by the rev dr bellows for several hundred dollars and finally transported to san francisco it added moderate gains to its enormous harvest even at that comparatively staid community six months later the sack with its irrepressible owner arrived in new york en route for the great fair at st louis he did not stop there and i believe the sum realized by the subscription given in this odd way to the sanitary fund was not much short of forty thousand dollars or eight thousand pounds closely allied to the spirit of gambling is the reckless and mercurial temperament of the western man when sacramento was being destroyed by fire and many a man saw his whole worldly substance going to ruin some of the merchants managed to save some champagne and going outside the town drank better luck next time this is a great country next day a tavern keeper had a space cleared among the ruins and over a little board shanty hastily run up was this inscription lafayette house drinks two bit who cares a darn for a fire what energy these people have i know a carpenter who arrived at a village one morning with his wife and child and chest of tools but having no lumber wood he pawned most of the tools to buy some 
he then obtained the privilege of building on a vacant lot and commenced at three o'clock in the afternoon at five o'clock the house was enclosed at sunset his family moved into the house and in less than an hour afterwards the good wife had supper ready the family slept in the house that night men who can work like that believe in work and have no fear of busting up a young english nobleman heir of one of the richest peers in england while waiting at a remote country station one day entered into conversation with one of the neighbouring settlers been in these parts considerable stranger yes for some length of time how long hey you been here a few weeks what's your business i have no business what are you travelling for then only for my own pleasure don't you do any business how do you get your living then it isn't necessary for me to work for my support my father is a man of property and gives me an allowance sufficient for my wants but suppose the old man should die in that case i dare say he'd leave me enough to live upon but suppose he should bust up here the conversation ended his lordship walking away apparently struck by a new idea travel is safe on most far western roads where there are no hostile indians about yet partly through old habit partly as a precaution absolutely necessary in some places nearly everybody goes armed and it is wonderful how many pistols will flash out when a street fight arises in any western town or even in san francisco itself a san franciscan who is justly proud of having helped to rear up so polite a town in a comparatively short time is very jealous on this point he continually impresses on a stranger that nobody sir carries weapons nowadays and he would perhaps convince you of this abstract doctrine did not one of the chilly forenoon winds blow up montgomery street and expose a neat colt at the waistband of his trousers i saw a man kneeling before me in a certain church in san francisco and as his coat-tail divided the handle of a huge navy revolver showed itself the knowing men however carry derringer pistols in their coat pockets you can always know a shrewd old miner explained to me when a man has a pistol in his pocket by the way he sits down in a chair if he plumps down he's safe but if he sits down cautiously and looks arter his coat-tails he's on the shy out certainly the same with a knife horsemen when travelling carry it in the boot and footmen down the neck hence a bowie knife is popularly known as a kansas neck blister but as for the far western rowdies montana and idaho territories are at present the only regions in the north pacific globe where they have anything like full swing for their playfulness in idaho region i heard of a man who came rushing down the one street of a mining village on a sunday morning he had been attracted by a noise and came on shouting what's the matter presently his excitement abated oh only a man shot why i thought it was a dog fight in that locality they used to ask at breakfast in a careless unconcerned way with their mouths full who was shot last night and they generally had a dead man to breakfast nevada has become rather more peaceable since it was elevated to the dignity of a state but at one time and in some places yet if one gentleman riled another it was the correct thing that the gentleman who was vexed at him should ask in a piquant tone whether he was healed and if he replied yes why then it was etiquette to tell him to turn loose an official went to a certain nameless state and inquired of one of the leading men for the sight of a copy of the state laws the leading man was very polite went to a drawer and producing a bowie knife about a foot and a half in length most sententiously replied here sir is a complete edition of them san francisco is now a very peaceable town and no longer would you when taking an airing in front of your door be startled by a bullet whizzing past your ear and a gentleman emerging from the dark to apologize for disturbing you having mistaken his man in the old days a culprit was hung for stealing an ounce of gold but was only fined heavily for killing a man a rowdy would take a bet that he would bring down a man on the other side of the street if the man shot had no friends and if there were enough hard swearing and bribery it was almost certain that the murderer would get off with slight punishment 
these were the days when ned mcgowan was judge than whom no greater scoundrel was ever expelled san francisco by the vigilance committee still street fights are not over only recently a man was publicly shot down in san francisco but his murderer got off because several witnesses swore that they saw the assassinated man put his hand behind as if intending to draw in the same street the most fashionable and crowded thoroughfare in san francisco there was a fight lately described in this cool matter-of-fact way by a morning paper Quote, there was a serious shooting affray in our principal street montgomery which resulted in the death of four persons it seems one bill davis a noted gambler who resides in wairika was interested in and drove a horse race which came off at placerville on the fifteenth instant and throwed the race making four thousand five hundred dollars by it hank stevens ball dutch abe and spanish bob four sports backed davis's horse and got broke swore vengeance killing at sight and so forth on the eighteenth they all came to this city except davis and publicly said they were going to shoot davis on sight and so forth on the twenty-first davis came in town and at two p m was getting his boots polished in a black's adjoining the fashion when ball and dutch abe came to the door and looking in exclaimed here's the dirty thief now and drawing their revolvers commenced shooting davis jumped out of the chair with one boot polished and drawing his revolver fired and ball fell dead across an iron grating davis then jumped out on the sidewalk laughingly saying you've made a mistake and fired at dutch abe the ball taking effect in his right breast he fell when davis ran and caught the revolver from ball's hand saying as he walked to the door of the fashion where's the rest of your murderers now blood was running down davis's left hand from the arm and also down the right cheek as he was on the point of entering the door he was met by stevens and spanish bob when davis raised the revolver and fired twice stevens fell and spanish bob jumped over him on to the sidewalk and fired davis staggered but recovering they davis and spanish bob commenced in good earnest each striving to fire a deadly shot davis was laughing then they commenced firing at each other about twenty feet apart after davis had fired two shots he threw the revolver at bob and changing the revolver he took from ball into his right hand he raised it and it snapped three times the fourth time it went off and bob fell davis had fallen before this and was lying with his face on the banquette davis threw the revolver into the street with blasphemies duly reported he then pulled a derringer and both having one shot each began crawling towards each other on their stomachs when about five feet apart they both raised partly up and fired simultaneously when bob's head fell and he remained perfectly still davis then said crawling towards bob he's gone i've cooked his goose and then partly turned on his side and tried to rise on examination ball and spanish bob were dead dutch abe and stevens mortally wounded the first having been shot through the right lung causing internal hemorrhage and so forth the latter was shot through the left breast spanish bob had four wounds on him two in the right breast on the right arm and one between the eyes ball had a ball in his heart davis had six wounds two in the right leg one in the right breast one in the left shoulder one in the left wrist through and one on the right cheek where a bullet had struck the cheekbone and glanced off cutting out a piece of flesh of the size of a ten-cent piece stevens died on the twenty-fourth at forty minutes past ten a m dutch abe died yesterday doctors say davis will certainly recover End quote it used to be at one time and is yet in the rougher places a signal for shooting if a man refused to drink with another whether an acquaintance or not or whatever his character behind the bar of a hotel at reese river in eighteen sixty three was the following announcement all guests in the house to be up by seven o'clock all in the barn by six o'clock every man to sweep out his own sleeping place no fighting at the tables no quartz taken at the bar any man violating these rules will be shot 
sociability may like hostilities in the far west be carried too far i was once called an unsociable sort of a beggar by the landlord of a roadside hostelry in british columbia because after having had a general lay-out on the floor with four gentile miners i objected to the company of a fifth companion in the shape of a jew peddler but the far western instinct recognizes that the line must be drawn somewhere there was once a western governor named powell famous for chewing and spitting of whom somebody remarked that he was a very sociable man sociable replied the individual addressed i rather think he is darned sociable i was introduced to him over to grayson springs last fall and he hadn't been with me ten minutes before he begged all the tobacco i had got his feet up in my lap and spat all over me darn ned sociable End of part four. Part five of the American Far West Seven Mid Nineteenth Century Views from Abroad by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part five Far Western Man. The far western American settlements of Great Britain and the United States yield us in odd freedom from conventionalities of life and off-hand settlement of difficulties much matter for laughter but none for ridicule there is a grandeur of its own in human energy that not only conquers land and wealth to the use of mankind but proves the inner soundness of the stuff men are made of by conquering also the bad passions of life in regions to which lawless men are tempted by the absence of all civilized machinery of law the rascals are at last compelled to stand in awe of honest men throughout the far west tracts of travel have been cleared of the white robber and assassin and are safe except here and there from the hostility of native tribes property lying exposed to theft is in many a new western settlement safer than in one of the towns of the old country public opinion has condemned the gambler and condemns the idler the foundations of a new society laid thus in the far west however rough they may appear are strong and sound and it is wonderful to see how fast the well-proportioned building rises from them races of north and south join in the west and do their pioneer work in a practical hard-headed way parted no doubt from some of the advantages but also from all the overgrown hypocrisies of civilization i look with respect even upon whittling as a symptom of the restless desire to be doing as well as talking in the north pacific where there are such extensive forests and odd pieces of wood are lying handy whittling seems to be the regular occupation of men's idle hours the municipality of san francisco put up wooden posts to protect the sidewalks from fiery charioteers over these hung knots of eager disputants and as mining stocks and swamp lands were being discussed they whittled at the posts until they became so thin that the wind blew them over i have seen a man in a backwood church begin whittling the wood of the pew at a trial in grass valley each juryman began whittling at a piece of wood he had brought in his pocket for the purpose regulating the energy of the action by the clearness of the evidence the trial lasted through a second day but as they had not expected a long sitting nobody had brought enough wood with him and accordingly the benches suffered first the gentlemen of the jury attacked that portion of the seat which showed between their legs until it had assumed a van dyke collar-like form and the assault on the other portion had proceeded so far when the judge finished his charge that he made a calculation that if the ends of justice had required the jury to sit for a third day there would have been nothing left for them to sit on old skippers hang about the wharf also whittling at coos bay there are only two marriageable girls and these being run after by all the young men of the district value themselves accordingly half a dozen oregonian youth sit on the veranda in front of their respective houses during the whole of sunday while each lady looks out at her followers through the half-opened window the lovers all the while are whittling bits of white pine which is an easy wood to work and valued for that purpose 
at dark they move home but the damsels find these visits profitable for there is generally left behind a pile of shavings big enough to light fires for the rest of the week the western man is a being of versatile genius if he cannot succeed in one profession he will turn to another there are plenty of lawyers who are miners and merchants who are doctors all over the northwest the head of the largest mercantile firm on the pacific coast is one who was educated for and practised many years in the medical profession and some of the most adroit politicians and wire pullers are styled doctor from having at one time been in the same way in life if one trade does not pay he commences in another and if there is not an opening in bullet city he vamooses the ranch makes tracks or gets up and gits for the groundhog's glory where there is said to be an excellent opening for either a butcher or a lawyer or a tavern keeper he will establish himself in one or other of these callings probably to bust up or to make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars he is always going to make just that particular sum he knows thoroughly that art without which no new country can grow great the noble art of coming down generals and brigadier generals of the great civil war are earning honest bread by industry the dashing cavalry leader to whom the young ladies wrote poems is in the grocery trade at chicago one famous officer has gone back to the plough another is a newspaper reporter another is writing a history of texas while practising law and photography the photography pays best for he has a contrivance of his own for giving the mexicans a very pale picture which is said to suit them exactly as they have a desire to appear as white as possible of such stock comes the true western pioneer notwithstanding the banter about his being so long in the legs and short in the body that a hat and a pair of trousers make a good suit of clothes for him he is a stalwart sinewy fellow infinite of resource rough in his talk with little learning and no formal piety ready to work no matter how often fortune defeats him he is ever hopeful of wrestling through somehow a peculiar character has grown up in the valley of the mississippi which may be called the western character from the mississippi it has spread and is daily spreading more and more to columbia it is the outgrowth of all circumstances surrounding it including climate and soil and the mingling of bloods it tends to individualism freedom self-reliance and large views there is little of narrow sectarianism in its secular life or religion little provincialism that is to say little of the prejudice that lives on for generations in an untravelled community the western character develops freedom and takes in large calculations this is more true of the man of western cities than of the farmer and the frontier man but still the character applies to all a western man thinks nothing of going one thousand or one thousand five hundred miles and has no traditional feud with any class of jew or gentile the elements of various nationalities flowing together westward form a strong and tolerant community if a man out west has his horse stolen he mounts another and traces the thief shoots him if he can the extending prairies immense lakes grand rivers seem to enlarge the whole conception of things the big farm yields thousands of bushels of grain the western man may have twenty horses a hundred mules and a thousand head of cattle grazing in his pastures and five hundred pigs fattening in his fields he reads the price currents knows all that is going on forms his own opinions and is loud and bold in the expression of them he is a man of patient courage who will lose thousands of dollars by the fall of the market and make less account of it than he would of the laming of a favorite horse or the loss of a faithful dog if he doesn't turn his loss off with a laugh and is pushed to speak of it you may see the gleam of stern grit flashing from his eyes as he tells you he will do better next time he is full of reckless and mercurial daring as impulsive as the southerner and yet practical in all things he sees and takes always the shortest cut to his end 
feeling about the sacred character of ancestral acres never disturbs the mind of a man whose possessions were reclaimed from the wilds but yesterday and may be left to-morrow whatever he has he will sell and whatever you own he is willing to buy providing he can make some boot on it with him all things were made to buy and sell a frontier man once described to me without the least idea of the strange character of the transaction how he had traded off a bible for a plaguy good fiddle if anything you have on you or about you strike his fancy he will at once offer to buy it and has no notion that certain pieces of property mayn't be for sale my own experience has lain chiefly among the vanguard of these pioneers the frontier man who paves the way for others less able or willing to cope with fortune less traders than labourers upon the land these are the people who are fast filling up with stern prose of the plough and the reaping machine and the whistle of steam what was once claimed by the pleasant poetry of the songs of the voyageur the coureurs des bois and the hunters and trappers of the great fur companies but perhaps it is better after all much as i have lived with the frontier man i have grown in liking for the pioneer who is always moving west hailing generally from some border state early in life he has settled down on some donation claim making it his boast that he is half horse half alligator what a touch a snappin turtle he soon has a good farm about him and remains until by the miserable style of agriculture learned in the cotton lands of the mississippi he exhausts the soil or until he considers himself inconveniently crowded upon hearing that he has got a neighbor eight miles off and more a comin then he calculates he'll move west and it's not long before he guess he'll locate still on the frontier in some little big snipe swamp or dead indian prairie and there he does locate until the old causes operating or his land becoming valuable he sells out to some less enterprising settler hitches up his old bullock team once more and with his loose cattle his horses his long kentucky rifle his douglas axe his a copper camp kettle and his long-handled frying-pan off he goes not forgetting his bouncing gals who rightly boast that they can lick their weight in wildcats his four stalwart sons each of whom can shoot the bristles off a wolf and drive a furrow so straight that as they tell you if followed up it would knock the centre out of the north star colonel he moves and moves still west rumbling every summer over the great plains go hundreds of such teams and many such men each fighting his way among sioux and blackfoot and snake until we find him in oregon idaho nevada or washington territory and possibly he even roams down open-mouthed in his wonder to californy but this part of the world is generally too civilized for him and the polished californians are not kindly affected to the individual in buckskin or homespun whom they profanely call the yaller bellied missourian the pioneer of pioneers must have been one jedediah s smith called jed for shortness who on the twentieth of december eighteen twenty six strayed too far into the great desert and from want of provision and water to get home with was compelled to push forward it therefore stands upon record as one of the many triumphs of the smith family that one of them was the first to make the overland trip from the states to california fortunately jedediah found american shipmasters from boston and nantucket who vouched for his honest intentions and perfect harmlessness he had attempted during the latter part of the preceding winter to make his way up the columbia river but the snow was so deep on the mountains that he was obliged to return being informed by one of the christian indians that the father would like to know who he was jedediah wrote a letter to father duran who lived at san jose in which he honestly confessed that he was destitute of clothing and most of the necessaries of life that his horses had perished for want of food and water that his object was to trap for beavers and furs and in conclusion he signed himself your strange but real friend and christian brother jed has been followed since then by many thousands scattered now along the frontier 
among them it was my pleasant lot to wander many a day and if they were queer fellows they were good fellows of more use to the world i think than many a fine gentleman who has never lifted heavier tool than an opera glass or served his country with a stroke of thought end of part five part six of the american far west seven mid nineteenth century views from abroad by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain part six far western chinese the chinese far from home traveling over the mountain trails almost anywhere in california no matter how remote and solitary may be your route you can scarcely fail to meet a curious figure sloping-eyed yellow-complexioned with a shaved head and pigtail carefully secured in a twisted knot behind clad in a loose cloth or calico garment half shirt half jacket trousers equally wide a long bamboo pole over his shoulder on either end of which carefully balanced are a sack of rice a piece of pork and a heterogeneous mass of mining tools and over all the head of this strange individual is covered with a hat made of slips of bamboo the brim of which equals in breadth a moderately sized umbrella this is john chinaman from home finding his fortune he always answers to the name of john he follows many ways of making his modicum of rice and the representative of chinese industry in this case is mining john the white miners only allow him to labor at the poorer diggings or at others which have been so well wrought over as no longer to yield returns enough to satisfy their ideas as to wages accordingly we find john at work in some remote locality which the stronger race has deserted or which is too poor to tempt them to drive out the chinese in former times this was frequently done and in the old california newspapers reports of such outrages or of meetings at which resolutions to do so were passed are quite common some years ago i had occasion to pass a few days with some chinese miners in the mountains they numbered some twenty men and occupied the deserted cabins of the miners who had formerly wrought in the locality every morning they would go down to the riverside and labor steadily washing the gravel for gold until midday when their slight meal of rice and vegetables was partaken of at six o'clock or thereabouts they stopped work for the day and after carefully washing themselves in the river they prepared supper i was the only white there and had made an arrangement with them about my meals accordingly my supper was first prepared an office which i generally superintended as they had according to my observation a nasty habit of incorporating rattlesnakes frogs slugs and such small deer in their stews after supper they would look to their little patches of watermelons cabbages and so forth and their head man would talk to me about his daily life or the province he had come from and to which he hoped before long to return the greater portion of them however after they had weighed out the proceeds of the day's labor and allotted each man his share by the aid of a swan pan a sort of miniature babbage's calculating machine would place themselves on their sleeping benches put a little tray before them on which were all the materials for smoking and soon drug themselves into a dreaming stupidity with the fumes of opium their huts were situated amid the most beautiful scenery by the banks of a fine river over which cataracts from the snow-covered mountains in the distance fell gurgling or roaring into the waters below but for all this on which i never tired of gazing my hosts seemed to care little they had no visitors save an indian on horseback now and then who treated them very cavalierly and rarely dismounted on sundays they generally laid over from work not from any religious motive as they were buddhists but merely as a day of rest and sometimes if they had been more than ordinarily successful one of them would go to the town or trading port distant some ten miles and buy some provisions and a bottle of a beverage called i quote the label fine old tom 
over which they made very merry for a few hours playing a rude description of musical instrument sounding like a paralytic drum they made however poor pay generally not more than three or four shillings per diem each though now and then they would come on a lucky pocket and return in the evening grinning from ear to ear the ground was however getting exhausted and they were then talking of putting their household gods on the bamboo pole and of removing to some more favoured locality which they had heard of go down into almost any town or village and you will find john moving about with that same silent air of his here he generally follows the business of a laundryman all through the by-streets and suburbs you can see his little cabin with a signboard informing that here lives wang ho washing and ironing buttons sewed on and peeping through the window you see the proprietor busily at work clear starching or ironing out the frills on the shirt bosom of probably the governor himself he has a large pan full of lighted charcoal which he uses as a flat iron and his mouth is full of water which he most adroitly sprinkles over the linen in a fine shower if you have any foul clothes he will follow you home take them away and return them again in a day or two charging about sixpence apiece for his trouble bargaining however that he has not to find linen collars for paper ones which may have been dropped in from the frequent warnings of washing john on this subject i suspect that it is a custom of the colonial gentleman by which our friend has suffered in time past in the suburbs of every town agricultural john is busy at work clearing the most unlikely pieces of ground for the purpose of raising vegetables for the town market these farmers or rather market gardeners are generally in companies of three or four and if you pass that way you can generally find one or other of the bucolic partnership driving the old cart and still older horse either from or to market if the latter is the case it is usually filled with several casks of garbage and so forth which the industrious proprietor has bought or begged from the hotel keepers for feeding his pigs with shopkeeping john is of a rather more aristocratic type he still wears his country's dress but it is of a fine material and his shoes are of the best description with the thickest of felt soles he is also more particular about his person and shaves his head with greater regularity than any of the labouring classes much to the advantage of his personal appearance for however smart a chinaman may look with his sprucely shaven head and neat pigtail he looks a most atrocious scoundrel when the hair is beginning to grow down on his forehead these little shops are chiefly patronized by their own nation or by the peddlers who at all seasons but more especially in the winter when the outlying settlers find it inconvenient to come into town for trifling purchases perambulate the country with two huge hampers swung as usual on either end of a bamboo pole over the dealer's shoulder most obliging are these chinese peddlers and they always make a point every christmas of making some little present to their chief customers and to the children most of the large storekeepers and wholesale dealers are men of education and refinement standing well with the commercial community but except on rare occasions never mingling in any society but that of their own people a few of them keep cheap eating-houses or restaurants frequented by sailors and others who have no objection to a dinner composed of very dubious materials so long as its cost does not exceed a shilling or eighteen pence many of them are general servants and in almost every house in northwest america the cook is a chinaman female servants are rare expensive and most independent so that our asiatic friends have almost a monopoly of the kitchen they get for such services from fifteen to twenty dollars per week with board and lodging while the young ladies who condescend to do house helping will demand from thirty to forty dollars coupled with the bargain that they are not to brush boots and are to have two nights a week and the whole of sunday to themselves they are not strong enough for labourers but what they lack in muscle they make up in industry 
accordingly working for moderate wages a large number of them are employed on public works like the pacific railroad indeed it is principally owing to the assistance rendered by them that the rapid formation of the portion of the line already completed on the west side of the rocky mountains is due they were also employed in considerable numbers on the panama railroad but had to be discontinued as they had a disagreeable habit when the day was very warm of fastening themselves by their pigtails to the dump cart used to empty the earth into the chagres river they also employ themselves to some extent in catching and drying fish for the chinese market every year they preserve several tons of the albacore or ear shell for exportation to canton where it is used in a variety of manufactures even their signboards are painted by themselves as it is dangerous to employ a jocular american especially when under the influence of monongahela whiskey near san francisco is a chinese washing-house surmounted by a signboard informing the passers-by that all's well we may be happy yet you bet which no doubt the innocent proprietor supposes to be an eloquent announcement anent washing and ironing most of their large firm's designations do not express the names of the owner or owners but are symbolic for instance they mean the widespreading firm the firm of the flowery land and so on all of their food clothing and so on with the exception of pork boots or mining tools are imported from china some years ago they were detected carrying on a most lucrative business in importing a liquid called chinese wine which was discovered to be a very strong brandy and accordingly notwithstanding its name excisable in the highest duties if a chinese dies in a foreign country mongol theologians seem to be agreed that it will go hard for him in the afterworld unless his bones repose in the flowery land accordingly the companies which bring the chinese immigrants over to california are under contract to take them back again after a certain period dead or alive a chinese funeral is a curious scene in san francisco a special burying ground called the yerba buena cemetery is set apart for celestial repose when carrying the body to the grave a solemn individual scatters little slips of paper with wise aphorisms from confucius written on them on either side and on the lintels of their doorways are strips of red paper on which are inscribed similar wise saws on the grave is placed a roast fowl some rice and a bottle of chinese wine after which the mourners depart never looking behind them there is however another class of gentlemen who assist at the departed funeral who are not so backward a number of the rowdies of san francisco who are concealed near at hand no sooner see the last of the mourners than they make a rush for the edibles and drinkables left for the benefit of joss and very soon make short work of them joss no doubt getting the credit after lying some months in the grave the bones are dug up and carefully cleaned and polished with brushes tied up and put into little bundles which are nicely labelled and stowed away in a small tin coffin in the particular hong or commercial house which is responsible for them footnote i notice an advertisement in a california paper about a new earthenware coffin combining the advantages of durability cleanliness and cheapness which latter virtue will no doubt commend it to the chinese undertakers the editor in a paragraphic puff remarks that any one having once used this coffin would use no other End note when a sufficient number of these interesting mementos have accumulated a ship is chartered and the coffins dispatched with their contents back to shanghai canton or hong kong i saw a vessel in san francisco harbor laden with four hundred dead chinese on some of the silent mountain trails i have come across some of these lonely graves only marked with a cleft stick in which was stuck a slip of red paper with the name of the deceased followed by one of the sage maxims of confucius confucius about the vanity of things earthly 
which the subject of the cousin of the moon who lay below had already experienced in his own person every year thousands of chinese are entering to supply the place of those who leave so that instead of decreasing their numbers are increasing with the country nobody liked john overmuch and some of the baser sort have the most determined enmity to him the storekeepers don't like him because he deals with his own people though they forget that he takes nothing from them and sometimes does put something in their pocket for mining tools beside all john's dealings are for ready money for though he may haggle long enough about the price yet he gets no credit though worse men may the labourer doesn't like him for he works for lower wages than he this is a favourite subject of growling with these lazy loafers as they doze away in bar-rooms with their feet on the top of the stove yet there is room for all of them and the chinese are only taken because white men can't be got politicians don't take him up because he doesn't vote and therefore is of no account in municipal or state elections and is not to be conciliated while the newspaper editor who ought to put in a good word for him is very lukewarm on the subject for john does not advertise while his detractors do accordingly poor john is kicked and abused with very little chance of redress he is hunted out of every good mining locality and he may think himself well off if he is not robbed and has his pigtail cut off as a lesson to him when of course the local paper will be sure to repeat the time-honoured joke about a long tail being cut short formerly rowdies thought it good fun to catch a chinaman and cut his tail off though as every one who knows that people is aware he would as soon you took his life as he is an outcast among his co-religionists until his hair grows some of them are christians and have given up this method of hairdressing but these are rare exceptions i am glad however to say that of late years the california legislature have made it a penal offence to cut off a chinaman's pigtail at the same time i never heard of anybody being punished though there are plenty of pigtails lopped off in the streets he is openly insulted in christian california i have seen a poor harmless chinese stoned by boys until he was bleeding hardly one being manly enough to take his part i have heard of others after whom ruffians would hound their dogs while the poor persecuted man was torn and bleeding and the law touched his assailants not the law passes acts against him taxes him heavily as he enters taxes him for making his living and taxes him at every turn it is quite a perquisite of the local official this chinese taxation and he is either a very just or by no means a smart man who cannot make a revenue out of the unfortunate celestial even the digger indian taking example from his superiors question mark, persecutes and robs john also if he finds him in the mountains and as our poor friend will do anything rather than fight he comes off very poorly indeed john it must be acknowledged has an insuperable objection to paying taxes notwithstanding his being in early life accustomed to be squeezed by a mandarin in his own country and he will often take to the mountains when he hears of the sheriff coming his way in southern oregon where nearly all the diggings are occupied by chinese the sheriff in order to take them by strategy has to send a few deputies in the guise of miners with packs of blankets on their backs who surprise john before he has time to escape and if he shows any symptoms of resistance with a revolver at his head force him to pungle down the dust i remember hearing a few years ago of some chinese who expecting the tax-gatherer went and took refuge in a cave which they had bribed a digger indian to show them after their guide had taken their money he went off to the sheriff and receiving another bribe informed him where they were hiding a fire was kindled at the mouth of the cave and the poor fellows fairly trapped had to crawl out one by one and to pay their money without loss of time they never think of the wretched economy of all this and of the loss of time being more than all the tax amounts to but only of the sum which has to be squeezed out of their hoard 
yet john is not such a bad fellow even when from home though rarely mingling in general society yet on high occasions he is most hospitable once a year in southern oregon the chinese give a grand dinner to which they invite the neighboring storekeepers and other friends these storekeepers almost live by the chinese as there are no native dealers there it is amusing to see the stock in trade of one of these cute yankees who is possibly a pillar of the church chinese gods papers to burn in the temple of joss chinese swan pans almanacs novels medicines pickled cabbage slugs and so forth possibly the whole superintended by a chinese clerk these entertainments were however greatly eclipsed by the grand dinner they gave to mr burlingame at present chief ambassador to the treaty powers on his way out to china as united states ambassador and some time previously to mr colfax the speaker of congress on the occasion of his visit to san francisco in eighteen sixty five it was given by the five great hongs or mercantile companies of san francisco and was quite unique in its way chinese dishes and european being both presented of the former i counted some one hundred and sixty-five but there must have been many more they included every possible delicacy shark's fins bird nest soup young bamboo scorpion's eggs and so forth and so forth and so forth eaten with chopsticks with dessert about the beginning of the feast including tea which is said to have cost fifty dollars per pound between the courses the hosts and guests left the table and were entertained by a chinese opera consisting of a one-stringed fiddle a sort of gong and something looking like a mud turtle on the back of which they beat they are exceedingly industrious and if a chinaman makes only half a dollar a day he will save half of it if he is well off he lives well but still saves at their new year in february all accounts must be settled up otherwise good reasons must be shown why he should continue in business or hold further commercial dealings most of them speak a sort of broken english known in canton as pigeon english and all are exceedingly anxious to learn still notwithstanding all their industry they will occasionally come to grief and land within the interior of the californian white cross prison a chinese named ah sam who kept the lord nelson restaurant in victoria vancouver island became bankrupt and was ordered to file a schedule of his assets not knowing the names of his customers he had entered a short description of them in his ledger and when he entered court he had nothing more than the following to show it was given me by his solicitor as a legal curiosity a butcher owes eighteen dollars captain of a schooner fifty dollars cook in a ship galley eight red shirt man twenty seven man comes late a printer ten cap man eight dollars fifty cents lean man white man twenty fat frenchman thirty dollars sixty two and a half cents captain tall man twenty dollars french old man eight whiskers man eighteen dollars thirty seven and a half cents blacksmith forty nine dollars barkeeper five workman five whiskers man's friends six dollars twenty five cents double blanket man six dollars fifty cents little short man ten dollars double blanket man's friend fifteen lame leg man forty fat man nine dollars twenty five cents old workman eight dollars red whiskers seven dollars fifty cents steamboat man eighteen dollars indian yaw four dollars sixty two and a half cents dick makes coal shoveler twenty eight dollars yea yap earrings twenty five flower pantaloon man sixteen shoemaker gone to california fifteen dollars sixty two and a half cents a man butcher's friend thirty nine dollars stable man sixteen get tight man seven footnote to tight drunk End footnote. 
the last entry the commissioner decided was of much too general a character to allow of the slightest hope of fixing the debt upon any one in particular in san francisco there are five great hongs or merchant companies called the yang wo the si's yap the sam yap the yan wo and wing yung companies these companies have large wooden buildings in the town where they not only carry on business but lodge and board all the people attached to their companies when in the city there are also benevolent associations to take care of the sick of their own people there are no chinese beggars in san francisco and that nation alone has no representatives in the public hospital most of the chinese on the pacific coast come to california under contract to one or other of these companies engaged at a low rate of wages generally about eight dollars per month and these companies again let out their labor in various ways this is essentially the coolie system and i think there need be little doubt but that this prevails in california the laborers are said to be very faithful to their contracts they have never yet learned to use the food of the people among whom they live rice is still the great staple with sometimes a little pork and on high occasions ducks and other fowls he is not however at all particular in his commissariat rats mice and even their mortal enemy the cat is not safe from john's omnivorous stomach i have often heard the miners venting curses both loud and deep on the prowling chinese who had cleared the creek of cats their houses have a peculiar faint sickening odor perfectly indescribable a friend of mine used to declare that they smell of nothing but effete civilization i have said so much about john's honesty that it may not be out of place to close this article with a few remarks upon the disreputable side of the chinese character on the pacific albeit some have been of opinion that there is only one side and that the shady one it cannot but be expected where thousands of men are continually arriving but that some rogues will slip in more especially when the laborers are recruited from the notoriously scoundrelly coolie population of chinese cities some of them are most adroit foul thieves and will clear a foul yard between sunset and sunrise they rarely attempt burglary and chiefly lay themselves out for the sneaking line as they pass in single file along the street with a basket on either end of a bamboo pole loose inconsidered trifles are speedily transferred from shop doors to these receptacles the thief marching on as innocently as possible some few years ago they put a considerable amount of base coin into circulation they were also accused of sweating the coin shaking it up in a bag for some hours and then burning the bag to obtain the few grains which clung to the fibres of the cloth they had a still more ingenious method of swindling and that was to split open the twenty dollar gold pieces adroitly extract the inside and then filling it with some metal of equal weight close the two sides again so neatly was this done that the union was not detected until some time after the trick had been in successful operation and then only in the mint at philadelphia they are notorious gamblers and expend a large proportion of their earnings in this manner in san francisco and all the large towns there are regular gambling houses and in the mining camps they spend a great portion of their leisure in playing generally for pice or other low stakes the keepers of these houses must be wealthy as they invariably pay the large fines which are sometimes inflicted on them when detected infringing the act passed against gambling houses they seem to have no idea of the binding nature of a legal oath and accordingly their evidence is always received most cautiously in the courts of law they are usually sworn by breaking a plate cutting the neck of a fowl or by burning a piece of paper before them they do not intermarry with the whites and few of the laborers bring wives with them there are upwards of fifteen hundred of their women on the pacific coast one thousand of whom are in san francisco and nearly all of them are of the vilest class 
the children are tolerably numerous in san francisco and are pretty little creatures with their sparkling black eyes and queer little cues behind eked out with green or scarlet silk suicides are very common among them the chinese seeming to care nothing for life they are mostly buddhists of a very corrupted type though a few christians are found among them the former have a fine temple in san francisco and in every house is a little family temple or joss house before which papers are burnt and offerings made at stated times with the exception of gambling and opium smoking they have few amusements in san francisco they support a curious little theatre where the music is a demoniacal band of gongs and the same play seemed to have been going on for several years when i last visited it and is not yet finished kite flying is a favorite out-of-doors amusement chinese kites made in the form of butterflies and birds which give out a singing noise are in great demand among the youth of the pacific coast occasionally on a sunday a few of them will have an out on horseback or in a wagon on these occasions some of them dress in european clothes and the horsemanship and general display is a sight for gods and men except on the great festival of their new year you see very little dissipation among them these holidays generally last three or four days when all business is suspended and you must wear foul linen until john your washerman has finished his jollification the morning of the first day of the holidays is ushered in by a loud display of crackers and other fireworks and before nine o'clock the streets are covered with red papers sometimes to the great delight of young california a whole caskful is let off at once a chinese merchant told me that it generally costs about one thousand pounds each new year for fireworks alone and some houses in the city will expend from sixty to eighty pounds for this item alone during this season no allusion to anything sad such as death sickness loss in business or any misfortune is tolerated by any one every sentiment must be of hope good will and good cheer every true subject of the flowery land does his best and the attire of some of the wealthy chinese far exceeds in cost the dresses of the richest of the whites a sable cape silk trousers and embroidered silk jacket make a very expensive turnout the greetings and salutations are very ceremonious and all imaginary blessings are included in the interchange of good wishes upon almost all the stores places of business and tenements of the chinese may be seen during the holiday season sundry strips of red paper pasted up inscribed with chinese characters they are usually five in number and are recognized in common parlance as charms but among those familiar with the usages of these people as the five blessings each is inscribed with a separate blessing such as health wealth friends long life and posterity at this period they also visit the temple observing certain religious rites and making offerings of roast pigs and other dainties to their idols which are afterwards withdrawn and eaten at their own feasts the first four days at the beginning of each new year are appropriated for the lower classes and thirty days for the gentry as a time of feasting in china but on the pacific coast the custom is somewhat modified some of the wealthy chinese keep up a round of festivities for two or three weeks while the special holiday season may be said to expire at the end of three or four days they have also other holidays in the course of the year about these times indigestion and other ills trouble john and the doctor has to be called in there are many of these professional gentlemen on the pacific coast grave-looking old fellows but generally arrant rogues deer horns when in the velvet are eagerly bought being esteemed a valuable medicament by the chinese the gall of a bear is valued at its weight in gold and the rare albino deer is equally prized in eighteen sixty four there was quite a furor in san francisco about a chinese doctor whose consulting rooms were besieged by the elite of the city his success was said to consist in careful regimen his medicines being very harmless 
he used however to ensure attention to diet and general conduct by laying down strict rules to diverge from which he informed his patients would cause certain death to ensue from the medicine he was of a fine appearance richly dressed and spoke through an englishman as an interpreter his lionization lasted a few weeks and after that he gradually dropped into oblivion to make way for some other sensation on the whole the rapidly increasing chinese population is an advantage to the american states and territories on the pacific as well as the british colonies further north they cultivate ground which no one else will and work gold mines disregarded by the whites they are consumers to some extent of european and american manufactures and whether or no their merchants pay taxes and import duties on the whole though kicked and abused simply because they are harmless inoffensive and weak and do not retaliate on the ruffians who maltreat them as would any one else they are an industrious people who if they do not become citizens yet do not interfere in any way in politics and in proportion to their numbers give less trouble to the law than any one else and are therefore deserving of every encouragement End of part six. Part seven of the American Far West Seven Mid Nineteenth Century Views from Abroad by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part seven Far Western Miners The Honest Miner one autumn a year or two ago in pursuit of my travels i struck into the wild mountain region of southern oregon just north of the california boundary line i had not gone far on the trail before i overtook a stalwart gray-shirted knee-booted individual he had a pack of scarlet blankets strapped on his back and as he trudged along for want of better company he held an animated conversation with himself an oath being most innocently introduced every now and then when the merits of the case seemed to call for it he was an old gold digger returning to his favorite creek he had been off on one of the usual digger wild goose chases after some fancied el dorado at a distance but was returning disappointed to the place where he had mined for many a year every locality was familiar to him as we walked together over the mountain or by the banks of the creek or stream down in the wooded valley my companion would point out to me with a half regretful pride the places where big strikes had been made in former times pointing to a ruined log cabin out of the door of which a coyote wolf rushed he assured me that the owner of that cabin had washed some forty thousand dollars out of a patch twenty or thirty yards in extent was he a white man i asked for there are numbers of chinese miners in that section of country wow was the reply not much he wore a dutchman in pacific coast parlance it appeared a white man did not altogether refer to the color of his face but to the quality of his soul and meant a good feller and a right sort of man and that dutchmen or germans and the inhabitants of the north of europe generally are not classed under that title they are too saving too steady and possibly too clannish for though he does become an american citizen as soon as he arrives this is with no view to any political principles he entertains but solely to facilitate the preemption of land and the acquisition of a lager beer brewery or the opening of a corner grocery canyon creek as the locality was named had once i was told been a bully old diggin but the stream having been pretty well washed out the miners had decamped to parts unknown leaving no address behind them like the arabs they folded their tents and silently moved away here was a half-ruined building choked up with weeds bearing record that it had once been the el dorado saloon in other words a gambling hell or worse and around it were a few cabins this had been the town site and the projectors no doubt imagined that it was to be the right smart chance of a city 
however fate had decided otherwise and the only traces of former greatness to be seen were piles of stones and gravel and long trenches and half-ruined ditches which gave the spot the appearance of a place where some great engineering operations had been left half finished here and there a solitary chinese slunk about intent on his own business and if my companion were to be believed in pursuit of stray cats as we turned a corner of the rough trail we suddenly emerged in front of the store by the door was sitting half a dozen of the old habitues of the creek lazily talking my friend was delighted there they are he cried loafing about chawing backy just as natural as anything he seemed to be a popular man among them as his friend friendships are quickly made in the west i was received with vociferations of welcome and the choice of half a dozen shanties to spread a blanket in in this way i saw a good deal of the honest miner of canyon creek and learned not a little of his ways of life and thought in this lonely little dell in the californian mountains of course we have all read about the miner in california british columbia or australia about his extravagance his boisterousness and his conduct generally and we are all too apt to think of him only as the roistering blade in the palmy days of eighteen forty nine or eighteen fifty three when gold could be had for the picking up the typical miner in eighteen sixty nine is a very different man from that of eighteen forty nine even though he be the same individual no longer do you as a rule see the many fine-looking handsome fellows in the early days of california fifteen or twenty years ago they were all young then but hardship has told upon them for in many cases they have pursued with varying luck that business of gold digging ever since the forty niners are the blue blood of the coast but they are proverbially poor accordingly these men among whom i associated on canyon creek were very different from our usual notion of the gold miner but were yet at the same time very characteristic types of what is well known on the rocky mountain slopes as the honest miner he is a peculiar individual and differs in many respects from the settler of late years enter his cabin and there is always indubitable evidence of a miserable life of single blessedness the gold digger is almost universally unmarried the rough blanket spread cot the axe hewn table with its scanty array of crockery the old battered stove or fireplace built of clay and stones the inevitable sack of flour half sack of potatoes and junk of pork the old clothes and old boots and a few books and newspapers go far in making out the extent of the miner's worldly possessions a little patch of cultivated ground enclosed by old sluice-box lumber is sometimes an accompaniment as well as a dog a cat or a few fowls the inhabitant of this cabin is often rough gray and grisly he came out twenty years ago and his residence has with few exceptions always been on the gulch where we now find him probably it rejoices in the euphonious name of horse beef bar bulldog point jackass gulch or groundhog's glory by these names it may or may not be found on the surveyor general's map but at all events it goes by no other he does his trading at a store at diggerberg credit he calls jawbone and talks about running his face for grub but sometimes this is objected to by the storekeeper as the gulch is not paying well and behind the counter you may see a mule's jawbone significantly suspended and below the words played out here the honest miner purchases a few pounds of flour a little tea coffee and brown sugar and as much as he can buy of whiskey he can tell where all the rich spots have been in the rivers bars gulches and flats but that was in the glorious wicked cutting shouting fortune-making times of yore he can't tell where there are any rich spots now he is certain there is a rich quartz ledge in the mountain yonder and if he could get water on the flat he is sure it would pay good wages excess of fortune spoiled him in forty nine economy is a myth with him and he cheerfully entertains half a dozen friends though his magazine of provisions as well as of money be in an advanced state of exhaustion 
his supper cooked he thinks of home that is the home of twenty years ago in reality he has no home mentally he sees the faces of his youth fresh and blooming but they are getting old and withered now he sees the peach orchard and the farmhouse from which he wandered a young rover when first the news of golden california burst upon the astonished ears of the world that home is now in the hands of strangers were he to go east as he calls it he would find himself a stranger in a strange land he thinks he'll go back some time or other fortune occasionally favors him a trifle more than usual and then he may make a trip up to the bay as he calls san francisco he stops at the what cheer house he may be seen there by hundreds poor fellow he came here to enjoy himself but he doesn't well know how the novelty of the city wears off in a day or two without occupation his routine of life broken he becomes a victim to a disease for which the french could alone have invented a name ennui at night he can go to the theatre but by day he sits in rows in the hall of the hotel crowds the entrance and sometimes blocks up the street if he have money enough and be so inclined he may go on the spludge and possibly get drunk but that with this class of minor is not very likely his face wears an expression of wild bewilderment and intense weariness unaccustomed to the hurry and bustle of the city he collides frequently with the denizens of the metropolis the spruce fashionably dressed frizzle-headed clerks who flit by excite in him feelings of contempt and indignation the swarms of youthful females in the streets astonish delight and tantalize him it is something so new to him there are few on jackass gulch and they would be better away when he knew frisco it was not much more than a collection of cotton tents on some sand hills now it is a fine city of one hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants females were almost unknown and the announcement by a steamboat proprietor of four lady passengers to-night was quite enough to ensure a crowded patronage for his vessel but the digger of the auriferous soil often leaves the city with the knowledge that the world has gone far ahead of him during his lonely residence in the mountains he had far better not have come in diggerberg he is somebody in san francisco he is lost among the crowd or at best is only a rusty old miner those who thus contemptuously talk of him forgetting that he and such as he were the founders and are yet to a great extent the stronghold of california i fancy i do not really wrong the honest miner in saying he does not possess much religion yet if a clergyman by any chance come into his camp he makes a point of attending meeting on much the same principle and with feelings of about equal reverence with which he would go to a dog-fight or a tight-rope performance because he looks upon it as the right thing to patronize the affair if the parson look on as he is washing for gold he will ask him if he would like to wash out a pan and as this invitation is usually accepted the worthy fellow will contrive to slip in among the gravel a tolerable nugget so that the washer may be nothing the worse for his clerical visit custom in such cases providing that the contents of the pan go to the visitor at one time there was a revival of religion among the miners never was there such a demand for tracts indeed so great was the demand that a special appeal had to be issued by a certain religious body whose mission it was to look after such matters for increased contributions to the dear gold diggers tract fund to use the words of the appeal the cry comes o'er the western wave more tracks more tracks at last the painful truth oozed out though i hardly think it was related at the may meetings that the miners used the tracks to paper their log shanties a friend of mine whose lot it was to officiate as a clergyman among them at one time used often to tell me that he had to ring a bell in the morning all through the apology for a street inviting his parishioners to divine worship and that finding nobody in church when he came in he first looked into one gambling saloon or tavern and then into another inviting those assembled there to come to church 
all right parson would be the good-natured reply we'll go there as soon as we played out this hand for the whiskies just be goin ahead with the prayers and things and we'll be along for the preachin this taking of drinks is characteristic of the miner no bargain can be made or any other matter of business or sociality settled without the indispensable drinks the same clerical friend whose experience i have just related was shocked on his first arrival among the miners at being asked to stand drinks after he had received a very liberal subscription towards the building of his church two mining companies that i know something about threw dice to determine which of them should treat the whole creek to champagne and as that wine was sold at fifteen dollars per bottle the cost to the loser may be guessed in most mining localities it is looked upon as a cause of mortal offence to decline drinking with the first fellow who shouts let's put in a blast colonel in some places it is quite a serious breach of etiquette not to ask all who are sitting round in the bar-room of a tavern though total strangers to step up and take a drink sometimes they do not require any invitation a friend of mine having had a long ride one day dismounted at a tavern to take more americano some refreshment when to his utter astonishment fourteen men who were sitting around stepped up and loud they would take sugar in darn he paid for the fifteen drinks as it was in strict accordance with the custom of the country but he took care not to go back to that hostelry again the australian gold digger is in many respects different from the californian but still he evinces the same carelessness of money it used to be the custom for these men to come down to some village after they had made a slight pile go each to his favourite public-house and give the money into the landlord's hand with the information that he shouted or asked all and sundry to drink until it was finished then the landlord at intervals would say step up boys it's jim jenkins shout then they all wished jim luck until jim's shout was out and then he went back to his gully proud that he had spent his money like a man on one occasion a miner came down and handed his money over to the landlord but contrary to expectation nobody would respond to his shout he had been a convict and lagged for some grievous offence the man was at his wit's end at last he struck upon the brilliant expedient of engaging an idler at labourer's daily wages eight shillings to drink with him and so he got through his holiday no one can tell where a rich mine will be discovered or where it will not even quartz mines which require skill to diagnose have been equally discovered by chance a robber fired at a man standing with his back to a rock but missed as the ball splintered the moss-grown quartz the miner who was attacked saw specks of gold sparkle in the moonlight it afterwards proved one of the richest mines in california two miners about to leave the country just to celebrate the event got on the spudge the night before their intended departure as they were coming home to their cabins in mere foolishness they commenced rolling stones down a slope one of these struck off the point of a rock which on being examined was found rich with specks of gold this changed their plans and they stayed and stayed to some purpose for they afterwards became very wealthy men the honest miner is far from being what may be called a domestic character if he were making five dollars per diem to the hand at greaser's camp and heard that somebody was making six at hellgate canyon in mountain goat gulch the chances are that he would presently disappear to the new el dorado now gold bluff was the point to which all were rushing that failed but it didn't dishearten the men they next rushed in thousands to gold lake and then the cry was fraser river which disappointed so many thousands that eventually it became a matter of as serious personal offence to ask a gentleman if he had been to fraser river as to tell him to go to jericho in eighteen sixty three the infuriated miner was blocking all the mountain trails and washoe was the cry in eighteen sixty four it was blackfoot in eighteen sixty six i saw hundreds rushing through slush and snow for big bend in the heart of the rocky mountains declaring that caribou wasn't a patch on it and that at all events they would see the elephant 
it is curious that men who have been on the pacific coast since the commencement of gold mining who have knocked about the rocky mountain slopes and have been the victims of a dozen disappointments should be so easily tempted again to risk fortune but it is so and the country would never have been what it is if they had all been as sensible as they might have been this vagabond propensity will fasten on a man who allows himself to sit in front of a frying-pan and a bundle of blankets on the ridge-pole of a sore-backed horse and i verily believe there are many men who if their history were known have travelled more and endured greater hardship in this way than many whose names are famous in the annals of travel and whom the geographical society delights to honour the true seeker after el dorado does not stop at distance or difficulties the pacific coast gold miner does not care to be called like the australian a digger the term in the former region being applied to and associated with a miserable race of indians who inhabit the mountains he likes to be called by the title i have put at the head of this paper the honest miner that he is honest enough as honesty goes in america nobody will deny to the profession as a whole but still there is occasionally the dishonest miner we do not speak of the rascal who is caught stealing gold out of the sluice-box and gets lynched for his pains but of the equally rascally individual who salts a claim before selling it that is he scatters a few pieces through the gravel before the buyer comes to test it in california some of the claims are wrought summer and winter indeed the winter is more favourable than the summer because water is more plentiful but in british columbia and in the rocky mountains the frost causes working to be suspended then the claims are laid over and the great body of the miners come down to victoria and other towns to pass the winter months and to spend the money they have made during the summer they also try to dispose of rather doubtful claims at this time and one of the means adopted is to report having struck a good prospect just before leaving it is remarkable to say the least of it how many good prospects are struck in this way the endless swindles connected with quartz companies are i dare say vividly enough in the memory of certain gentlemen in the city of london and elsewhere whose purses were longer than their foresight gold mining will always be a staple industry in the rocky mountain slope and the increased immigration and attention excited by the pacific railroad will greatly increase the business but the old miner will be killed off large companies will work his claims and shoals of new hands will crowd his solitary valleys men who know not the old traditions and have no sympathy with the old manners he himself will meet them half-way and will unconsciously lose many of his characteristics and peculiarities he will get toned down to the duller routine of other workmen as his pursuit takes its place among the industries end of part seven end of the american far west seven mid-nineteenth century views from abroad by anonymous